Call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's uh, special council meeting has one item on the agenda. Uh, I know Shannon is here, but she'll note that all council members are present with the exception of Mr. Malloy, and I would assume that Mr. Malloy should be here within the next few minutes. Are there any amendments to the agenda tonight? There are none tonight, sir. And any declarations of conflict, export to contact site visits? I am going to recuse myself tonight and declare a conflict of interest, but before I do and before I leave, I want to get some facts on the table because to be blunt, and this is not directed at anybody sitting out there, it wasn't from you, but to be blunt, I'm tired of the false statements being made. So I'm going to clear up, make a statement uh, regarding comments that have made about, been made about myself as it pertains to this particular development, and then I will leave before the public hearing starts. So there's a, two letters received by the Coeur d'Alene Press. And I'm not even going to mention the, the author's names. I've got them. I'm not going to mention them. Jacobson is involved in the North Shore PUD. The Jacobson loan to the developer is related to the North Shore PUD that was approved a few months ago. In the process, the attorney for the group, doesn't say which group, doesn't mention the attorney, has found documents showing the bank CDA extended a million dollar line of credit to the developer and Jacobson did not disclose or recuse from participation in the hearing. From another, in the August 1st edition of the press, the Post Falls mayor seems to be responding to my Your Turn article and flatly states, we do not make mortgage loans. I found this on the Kootenai County uh, Recorder website. It's a deed of trust, there is an amount, it's in the name of the proponent, and the bank is uh, the lender. He says, make of this what you will, but perhaps a reporter could ask him about this. The reporter didn't. Perhaps he should have before he goes out making these uh, outlandish statements. Number one, I am not involved in the PUD. I've, looked at, I've not even looked at the information on it. I've not talked with the, the proponent about it. I know nothing about it. Number two, the loan to the developer now... Just so you know, graham leach Bliley Act, Federal Act, prohibits banks from disclosing information pertaining to their customers. It protects your privacy. So I visited with the proponent and asked if I could make the statement, and he authorized me to do so. So the loan to the developer is relate, uh, related to the North Shore PUD that was approved a few months ago. No, it is not. So they go on to public record search, and they find a deed of trust. Yes, there is. That was... And, and to go back to the last question where I state we do not make mortgages, if someone comes to my bank looking to purchase a home and asks, for, asks us for a conventional mortgage, we don't do them. We refer them off to other people. We get no incentive, no compensation, nothing for it. We do not make mortgage loans. We do make home equity loans. Home equity loans can be used for home improvements or, or other particular purposes. And if you secure a home equity loan, it's secured by a deed of trust, which shows as a mortgage. So the authors of these two letters have made these vast jumps without, to conclusions without any facts. So, again, I'm not involved in the PUD. The loan to the developer was not for the PUD, uh, and I did not recuse myself. That's because it's been before planning and zoning. This development has not been, been before us. So, uh, and again, I, I explained a simple uh, banking 101 for the second letter. The fact that it shows as a mortgage does not necessarily pertain, means that it is a conventional mortgage loan. It's home equity for private purposes, private uses, personal. So I mentioned this, again, not directed to anybody out there, but I want you to know that statements made had better be true. These statements, which were sent to the press to ask to be released, are false as false can be. All right? I just want to save everybody coming up and making statements that are, that pertain to this that are not accurate. And with that, I'm going to recuse myself. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Council President Linda Wilhelm. Oh, I'm 
sorry, Linda, one more thing. The reason I am recused myself, I guess I should explain, <coughs> is because I do have a business relationship with the proponent. It has nothing to do with this particular development, but in my opinion, a perceived conflict can be as bad as an actual conflict. So I am declaring a conflict of interest and will not participate. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay, before we get started, we did get a couple of written comments emailed into the city late this afternoon. One of them was from Harlan Shrinkler, and want to let um, Harlan know that we did receive this. It is dated 9-10-2021. The city council does have copies of this, and if you, have you read this? Everyone read this? Okay. And the second one is um, from the Gables, again, uh, dated September 6th, but we received it today, and the city council has copies of this. Did you get a chance to read this? I did. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, Quickly for clarification, everybody's had a chance to review both the letter from the Gambles as well as the online uh, comments from Mr. Schlinker. Yes. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'll open the public hearing. And uh, first of all, it's going to be staff comments, and that looks like it's going to be Councilor John Wilhelm. Hayden. Before we get started, there's a couple of procedural things that we wanted to cover quickly. Um, a couple of items that we need to address. First, um, we received a written submission on September 10th that didn't come in through one of the three authorized ways to receive written comments. I don't think that's a big deal. It was received timely. Having said that, our rules say that it doesn't come in through the right portal, that we don't admit it into the record. Um, we do that because we have had occasion where written records have been submitted to city email addresses that have nothing to do with the hearing process and those things don't make it into the record because the person's receiving it doesn't know what to do with it. So we have a rule that says it has to come in in writing to this address via email to this address or you can hand deliver it. In this instance, uh, because it was received timely, I don't think that's a big issue and I would ask that the mayor waive requirement for that and allow it to come into the record. Our hearing procedures allows for the mayor to make that comment. In this case, it would be Councillor Wilhelm since she's sitting in. Our rule allows for uh, the mayor, or in this case, the, the council president to, um, is authorized to revise default time frames, the order of proceedings and make other procedural rulings provided the due process rights of all parties are protected here. There's no harm, no foul. So I do think we should allow that into the record. And that would be the recommendation I would make to. Okay, and so um, just for the record, we are uh, referring to the Lyons O'Dowd letter dated September 10th. That's correct. 2021. So thank you. Yes, that's fine. So the other uh, two other issues. The second one I want to bring up, I just became aware of uh, Ms. O'Dowd intended tonight to speak on behalf of multiple people as a spokesperson. Our rules require that, that staff be notified six days in advance so that we can make arrangements for that. Um, apparently they, they did not know that, so they had, didn't make that notification. Again, I think that the mayor, in this case, Councillor Wilhelm, could make that adjustment, allow her to speak longer than the allowed four minutes what that would do is that would require the folks that she's speaking on behalf of to not speak tonight and give their time to her. Um, I haven't had a chance to speak with the applicant or the representative to see if they have any objections to that, but that would be another thing that, that you should consider. So with that, I would leave that up to you to figure out how you want to proceed on that one. Okay. How would and you like to proceed? <laughs> so, a question. Yeah. On the amount of time, so if you're speaking for five people, so if you're you speak the length that five people would. You get up to 15 would... minutes if you're speaking as a spokesperson. If you're not speaking as a spokesperson, you get four minutes. I'm okay with the 15. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And should we ask that? Is the applicant here? So we would. Uh, I'm assuming yes. Susan is here. If you want to step up, Susan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That work? So the only thing we'd need to know is who she's speaking on behalf of and when she comes up, if she would just tell us, we can mark that down and, and those people would not then be allowed to speak on their own behalf. Okay. Okay, okay. all right. 
Thank the you. last thing I wanted to point out to you is uh, a little bit of clarification about what we're doing tonight. <coughs> so um, while we're here, in theory, on an appeal, our rules, the way we treat appeal hearings from, from the Planning Commission when they come to the City Council is it's a de novo hearing, meaning we're starting from scratch, it's a new hearing, procedural issues really are not before you tonight. Uh, allegations or claims that the Planning Commission decision wasn't supported by substantial evidence that's what we're doing tonight we're collecting the evidence we're building the record so those types of arguments are really not germane tonight what we're doing tonight is we're having a hearing just like all of the other land use hearings that we do where we consider whether or not the applicant has shown that their proposal meets all of the approval criteria and that's kind of it that's what we're up to so any questions anybody not yet Okay. Certainly. That's all I've got. <laughs> okay. Thank you, John. Good evening, Council President Wilhelm and other members of City Council. Uh, John Manley, Planning Manager here for the City of Post Falls, presenting the staff report for the North Shore Subdivision and PUD Appeal. The case file numbers for these is PUD 1 2021 and SUBD 1 2021. The owners are Tedder Properties. LLC with the applicant being Scott MacArthur at the time of this application was of H2 surveying LLC so as stated they're looking for PUD approval and to subdivide approximately 10 acres into 47 lots this was presented before the <coughs> planning and zoning commission on February 9th and there is an appeal obviously and that's why we're here this evening project location is just due east of Greens Ferry Road and Ponderosa Boulevard on the south side there. We're in the hatched area. Current land use on the site is vacant. Its physical characteristics are sloped and treed. As stated, 4.7 units per acre about is being proposed with the city of Post Falls providing both the water and sewer. Surrounding zoning, you see here everything to the north and east that's within the city of limits is also R1, and you see the hatched area there again with the project location proposed site. It's a bit small, I apologize for that, but um, the intent of this is you look at the R1, that's on the left side right here. Um, it's the R1 single family, it has a max dwelling unit. Uh, per acre of five units and down here you see kind of the rules of the PUD that they could go up to that they would have to dedicate 10% open space and then couldn't exceed that unless they gave additional open space of 5% then they could potentially go up to 5.5 dwelling units per acre and that's just an additional note for what kind of the ground rules are for an ask a PUD ask for that matter their plan also you see here I have this boxed in area this is this is their internal road layout that they're planning is coming in off of Ponderosa and then having basically ride two ridge lines for into a cul-de-sac but on the east side of their proposal they are proposing a retaining wall along that eastern boundary and hence that's why the staff did propose a condition that if for some reason this was approved that you'd have the engineer design of the retaining wall along the eastern boundary and it would have to be reviewed prior to a grass a mass grading permit of the site some basic PUD standards that they're proposing here's their their layout once again they have a bulk emplacement table they're proposing you can't read that so I kind of zoom in a bit they have different products that they're designing they're proposing with their PUD. They have some townhouses, cottage house, a tree house. Um, they have different kinds. They have a TW. You can see this, and I'm going to go show you a map here in the next slides where they kind of where that comes into play. They have different acronyms based off product. Based off that product type, they're proposing different heights and minimum lot widths. The reason why that's important is because with the R1, if I go back to that bulk placement table. A typical minimum lot width for an R1 is 60 feet wide and so the PUD is how you and how 
any PUD in Post Falls generally developed is if they can't meet the standards in some frame of fortune with bulk emplacement, they generally come to the city and they ask for uh, modifications to what otherwise be, would be permitted. In exchange, they often they provide open space, so it's part of that the PUD element. You see here on note two, the front <coughs> setback, they say a 10 foot minimum setback, including garages at minimum 11 by 20 feet, guest parking spaces alongside garage. If guest parking space is in front of the garage, front setback to be 20 foot minimum. The reason why that's important is because their product type, staff wanted to make sure that they at least provided some on-site parking. Besides the two off-street requirements, that they have some on-site that it reduces the potentiality of congestion within alleyways. Kind of highlighted here where that minimum lot width was asked. That acronym I mentioned for the PUD design, you see that here, the TO there, the COs, the TWs, and the T that's where they're intending for that product type to go in those locations and they would follow those setbacks and that would be the the lot sizes for those areas so these are constrained the constraints that they're proposing to impose on this PUD so what staff looks at when you in a proposal is we have review criteria for a PUD and the first one is the proposed PUD provides for adequate utility services and parking to service the proposed development in the staff report, you've seen commentary within it about the ability to service both water and sewer. The next slide I will show some more details on the parking element. Additionally, the PUD provide for an integrated transportation network that adequately serves the proposed development. Uh, the engineering division did review the street network internally and found out the found that the private streets would work. Additionally, also with the improvements on the south side of Ponderosa that also would be compatible with uh, that as well, that, that roadway. Any questions detailing for um, traffic? Bill Melvin's here and can answer those. On to the parking in this proposal. So the two spaces per unit, that would be the minimum required per code because we were allowed two per offsite. They are providing intend to provide some guest parking alongside the garages in front of the garages, hence that condition that was mentioned. I highlighted the on-street parallel parking. We don't typically credit the, uh, on, the on-street parking, but that was in their calculations at 3.74. So I subtracted that 40 out and it came up with 2.9 off-street, which would be greater than the two minimum per code. When you're talking about on-street parallel parking, those 40 units, is that on, um, what's this, Ponderosa? Or is that no, that would be internal on their private streets. Okay. okay. So we didn't calculate anything on Ponderosa, correct? I don't believe there's parking allowed on, uh, but yeah, Bill's saying no, there's no parking allowed on Ponderosa. Okay. So, okay. Continue. The third criteria, looking at the proposed PUD provides enhanced community design by conser conserving and incorporating the site's significant natural, scenic, and or historical features in the development. The next one is, and I'm going to have some slides that go into this for the detail. Integrating a mix of compatible land uses in the development and adequately buffering and or separating any incompatible uses in the development. So that one's really focused about the development itself. The next one's looking at locating of the proposed uses and lot sizes in the proposed PUD in a manner that blends with the surrounding uses, neighborhoods, and public facilities. And then the fourth one there under that criteria three or re is provide at least 10% of the gross land area for open space. So going into each one of these individually looking at conserving the site for this natural and scenic topography it was in staff's opinion that the attempt to utilize the uh, ridge lines for the roadway and to 
utilize the housing to blend in with the natural um, slopes was better than potentially regrading the whole site and basically blowing it up and creating a whole new grade with maybe a series of switchbacks. Uh, so this appears to look at the natural grades and create a road network that works with the natural terrain. This here looks at the grades, this black and white version. You can kind of see how the grades kind of drop off from that proposed road network into that ravine where that cart path is at or being proposed. Looking at internal development, is the mix compatible within it and is there adequate buffering and separating within that mix? Looking at this proposal, you see that the majority of the development is separated either through a private drive. There is no lots that back up with backyards to each other. They either back up to a, a tract that has a private road or a natural open space uh, to uh, collect individuals to their common open space along the southern extent of their property along the <coughs> river. Therefore, staff concluded that they met this element of the criteria. Locating the proposed uses in a lot sizes in the proposed PD in a manner that blends with the surrounding uses, neighborhoods, and public facilities. So looking at this, you do have a mix of housing uh, in different densities. When it comes to single family R1, um, typically planning wouldn't see these as incompatible with other R1s. You're just looking at a, the same housing product on a different lot size and maybe a different form. Looking at, you saw in the staff report, they're proposing about 12% open space, therefore they'd be meeting that criteria as well. The fourth criteria, the proposed PUD provides for timely development of the property and security for future completion and maintenance. This is more pertinent to large scale PDs, it may be, lot, it may be 300 acres and they're phasing in time. This being as small as it is in a single phase, they'd be able to meet this and be a timely development. Kootenai County Fire did have some concerns initially. Um, I kind of go into that on their initial submittal. Initially, they had a couple of dead end rear loaded um, parts to this product, these townhome products here on the south of that um, alleyway. And what was agreed upon, and actually you saw in the um, staff report, an exhibit where Kootenai County approved this as a, a method to meet their concerns and there's a, a gate and a key, and there would be an access right off here, a fire access gate. Also, the area would be maintained by an HOA. So with all that together, uh, you saw in the staff report that it would be concluded that they would meet that criteria. Going to the subdivision review criteria, we're looking at, there's six of them. The first two are two are dealing with utilities, um, water and sewer, as stated in the PUD and in the staff report. We'd be able to facilitate that. Additionally, there was some um, elements you've seen with some of the, they may have to have on, on site lift stations for individual ones to get some of the flows to work for individual houses. Proposed streets are consistent with the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. You've seen there also in the staff report, it mentioned as part of the PUD, they'd be able to meet that. All areas of the proposed subdivision, which may involve soil or topographical conditions presenting hazards, have been identified and that the proposed uses of the areas are compatible with such conditions. Um, I think you saw in the um, Staff report, there was an analysis on the suitability of, of that, the, the conditions, the recognitions of the slope, and that they'd be able to meet this through um, their permitting process. When it deals with zoning, this criteria kind of dovetails into the PUD ask. If it meets the PUD criteria and the PUD is approvable, the fifth one is interesting going together because it says 
the area of the proposed subdivision is zoned for the proposed use and the use conforms with the other requirements found in the code. So as a straight up R1, if this was no PUD, it wouldn't meet it. But if it meets it through the PUD, it would be consistent with criteria five. Does that make sense? So we can't approve the subdivision without approving the PUD? More or less, the decision on the PUD should come before the decision on the subdivision. Okay. The sixth one is the development's paying for its fair share for its impact on growth. This is done through impact fees. And that's done at the time of permit. The elements of the residential impact fees is for parks, public safety, and streets. Other elements that are uh, considered, we have a flood damage prevention section. Um, Title 15, these uh, three uh, review criteria are to be reviewed. You see here in the staff response that the look, they did present a firm that was exhibit A8 in the overall packet as part of the, the PNZ packet. They also acknowledge the BFE at 21, 31 feet and that the structures and roads were above that BFE. John? Yep. So the flood damage prevention, is that more tied to the fluctuation of the Spokane River or is it from the stormwater runoff? What was the first part, sorry? Well, it's, you have flood damage prevention, is that more tied to the various levels of the Spokane River seasonal or is that from the runoff from stormwater and the the system there it's for um, the they're looking at the river itself the elevation the fluctuation of the Spokane River what that max elevation could be on a hundred year flood okay that's where they established that BFE so for flood it's tied to the the river fluctuation. yeah not the ravine and not, that, and not the ravine and correct. not the storm water that could run off then okay yep. and now would it come up in this next section here where it talks about the public utilities, facilities, sewer, gas, electric, water systems located and constructed to minimize flood damage. You can see here that they did submit an erosion control plan for their site. Development needs to contain their water on their own, their own site and not um, have it run off onto neighboring properties. Oops, sorry. So they appear to be able to meet those elements of the flood, flood damage prevention program and the site disturbance. Here's the agencies that were routed. Um, as part of the appeal, we did not hear from anybody, uh, but we did hear from these individuals as far as the previous postings and they remained neutral as far as the police program. The highway district had no comment and like I said, Kootenai County did site before that they approved subject to that condition of providing that uh, fire access on a, off of Ponderosa. So Any there's questions for John? I just got another one. So on the responses, did we hear anything from uh, DEQ then on this site? Not on this one. <clears throat> um, one other question I have is on the park they've set aside for open space that'll be a private park then there'll be no public admitted to use that park there'll be it'll be publicly accessible for those that are within that development <laughs> okay you no, guys no. okay come on let's not do that okay let's let everybody talk and okay the uh, okay. open space requirements in the PD doesn't delineate how that open space is created some are to the benefit of the city of Post Falls and they become city parks. Some become private parks to benefit those there. They have a, it doesn't, they don't, it doesn't delineate at all. In there. So that's what I was getting at. In our ordinance, it doesn't say it has to be open to the public. That's up to the developer or the, when it comes to the PUD process. The public as a whole, that's true. Okay. And I got one last question on the cart path. What is the width of, is that just going to be the size of say like small carts or will it be drivable for automobiles or is it just? I believe it's wide enough for a golf cart path, but I would let the applicant can probably answer okay. the 
the width they did desire for that. Okay. Al? I'm done. I see Warren wants to chime in on this. I just want to quickly answer your question, uh, Councillor Anthony. Our city code specifically allows for open space to be privately maintained. I'm looking at our code 1820.080 um, under maintenance of open space. Open space areas may be either privately maintained or dedicated for public ownership and maintenance. It's, it, we explicitly allow for the open space to be solely set aside for residents or members of the PUD. Yeah. And they maintain it. And they maintain, they maintain it. it. If they want the public to maintain it, they have to get the approval and permission of the city before we take on that obligation. And typically, Parks is not interested in anything less than five acres. So you would need at least a 50-acre development to yield at 10 percent the size that um, Parks would be interested in. And if Parks was interested in it, it would be open to the public? Yes. 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 Alan? Got a couple questions before we get too far down the road here. Uh, <clears throat> when I read 1820 dash or 18-20-080, which refers to POD, PUDs, it does state that PUD is, is intended to enhance community design. Can we talk about that? Does this sure. enhance community design? Or is that specifically just to this section? <clears throat> I wouldn't say that this here is going to establish its own co small community. Okay. So community can be a community as a whole, or it can be the community with the development with its own identity, too. Okay. Uh, it also sp speaks to the open space. It says open space for the community. Again, are we... We're not, we haven't really defined what community. I guess when I read that, I think in terms of community as a whole versus the community as, a, as the PUD. Once again, I think um, the same line can be drawn between the, on my previous statement. Okay, that's good. Question on the open space as a whole. It's really hard to look at a flat map and see changes in elevation but it's that area at the southern part of the property that's designated as the open space, correct? Yeah, and there's, I believe this is tracked. I, I realize that's part of it too, but I'm more concerned about that piece down at the bottom. <clears throat> is that buildable area? As they're proposing, it wouldn't be because they'd be net summed out with this many lots. Um, no, no. I just, I, what I'm getting, I guess, let me kind of clarify what I'm getting at. One of the things we talked about most recently in the last couple of years is that when we designate an area as open space, it's got to be usable. It can't be a parking lot. It can't be certain things. It can't be swales. It's got to be usable. I don't know this property didn't walk the property you're not supposed to but what I'm trying to determine is is that designated open space usable in my opinion it would in my opinion it would be in different forms I mean if you go down the cart path I mean you more than likely aren't going to be scaling the hillsides but you're going to have some views there be it as it may it, to each his own and their own pleasures for that matter okay. and then you get down to the lower matter lower area I believe that there'd be usable down there for different functions and so so in your opinion does this if we go back and look at it from the standpoint of usable space for recreation which is in our code is terms of how we define what open space what fits is there at least 1.2 acres of usable space in review of the record I did deduce that they met the usable space of 12 percent that they proposed okay excuse me one second um, I'm wondering if the city attorney could possibly read that part of the code sure. so what it says regarding open space requirements a minimum of 10 percent of the gross land area in any PUD must be reserved for open space areas used for a mix of active and passive recreational activities by all occupants of the area being developed. Individual open space areas within the site should be large enough 
to be used for parkland or other recreational uses while remaining within reasonable walking distance. It goes on to talk about it. You can't use parks, streets, utility easements. You can potentially use stormwater areas if the use of the stormwater area doesn't um, negate the, its use for recreational purposes. There I'm thinking of areas that have designed um, <coughs> soccer fields that <coughs> at times serve as overflow stormwater detention, but the bulk of the time they're a soccer field. Okay. So that's the thing we were trying to leave open there. So the idea in the code was that there was a mix of active and passive act activities available. So it could be a range from ball courts to benches where people sit in and watch the river flow by. It, it's supposed to be a allowing a range of activities. Right. Okay, and that's really what I was trying to get to because, you know, again, I'm not familiar with the property, but I do know from looking at some of the geotechnical stuff that there's a lot of slope to this, and I didn't want, I didn't as in essence want them to be able to say, oh, yeah, we gave up, you know, 1.2 acres of land that really isn't usable at all, but because that's what it needs to be. But you're telling me that it is usable. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Carrie? I'm good. Okay, Steve? Just one last question, and I'm, it's back to the open space, because it does have riverfront frontage there on the Spokane River. I think the pictures showed it at uh, the low water mark when the, the gates were opened mm -hmm. that we had in our packet. So when the we have the pool in the river, is that part, is there still a little bit of beach there, or is that more of a grassy area that just comes down to the river? Like, I'm like Al, I've never walked it, I don't know much about the property. I apologize, I don't have that image that was in the packet that showed the high water mark in relationship uh, to the structures. Okay. On this, yeah. the applicant may have that available. Okay, so when it was in their packet. Could be in, yeah. yeah. Okay. I do have one more question, Councilor. Go ahead. President. Um, <clears throat> so this has already been annexed, annexed in as an R1, correct? Correct. Applicants asking to create this uh, PUD. How many units could be practically built on this property without a PUD? <clears throat> I know this is a tough one. It's a bit subjective. I mean, without seeing a layout and how they regrade it, but typically if they left the exact same road layout, you'd have to imagine 60 foot wide lots, 6,500 6, square feet lots. So that would, I don't know what that would yield at at. I guess what I'm getting to is there's going to be a lot of concern about traffic, about density, and those kind of issues. And I'm just wondering how much of this PUD is really adding to that, whether it's twice as much or 25% more. That might be a good question for Bill. I don't know. Well, okay. Well, we'll see if there's. I've thrown it out there. Maybe else, somebody else out here can uh, do some research real quick. I mean, typical if it was flat land, you'd struggle to get more than four dwelling units per acre. So 40 would be what you would yield on a flat piece of dirt. It's about four dwelling units per acre. And we're talking about 47? Yeah, with slopes and all that, so. Okay. Steve? Yeah, one last. The homes that will be along Ponderosa, those are designed to be townhomes, I believe? Yes, these ones along uh, the north, yep. Because uh, I read somewhere in the packet somebody stated they would be duplexes. So I believe if, if they're townhomes, these would be owner-occupied townhomes. They're not going to be rented out to people. So in looking at this lotting pattern, a lot of times people use duplex in townhomes. They get confusing because it all depends on how you plat it. As they're proposing, they'd be single-family what you'd call twin homes. Twin homes. Or, yeah, so they'd be attached, platted, owner-occupied, common-walled, zero-lot-line product. So they're not rentals. They'll be. Well. Could be. Could be, but. Yeah. A house can be a rental. Yeah. Are you good? Good. Okay, John, I do have a question. Um, back to the twin homes, townhomes. Um, so there is no access. Um, from those places on Ponderosa uh, that are fronting on Ponderosa, there's just the one entrance 
coming in there, mm -hmm. right there. Uh huh. And then, um, so what? What does that? What is that street going to look like? I mean, it, is it just going to be um, the townhomes there, and then the sidewalk right, right off that j to the north, where your little Up thing on is? That right, area? Yeah, right there. What is that? I mean. Is Valley. that a sidewalk then, and then the road, or is it landscaped, or is it? It's obviously not fenced because it would be the front yards. No, it's an alley. The front on Ponderosa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the fire? So, so then it so is the going to be. be. So right here, you'd have. They're going to do the standard, typical. Okay, I see. Okay. Development on the south side of Ponderosa, where you complete your um, landscaping and frontage improvements on the south side. And then internally they'll come in and then you'll see they'll have the private alley that'll come up okay they're not doing this because this was um, uh, the whole condition with fire wants it over on this end but then you would come up you'd rear load those um, attached twin homes townhomes and they'd be fronting ravine drive okay and so all right okay i get it all right that's fine thank you okay anybody else for john I have a lot of questions. I'm not sure exactly where to ask them. So, okay. Well, we'll move Remember on, that and he, you close he can hearing. he can come back up. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we will have the applicant, and the applicant will have 15 minutes. Which one's yours? I will be using it. Thanks. Okay. Move everything out of my way. I can mess with. Good evening, Council. I'm Susan Weeks. I'm an attorney here on behalf of the applicant. Normally, um, technical staff would speak to you first, but even though this is heard de novo, because we're on an appeal, I'm going to address some of those issues. Technical staff is with me tonight, Glenn Lanker and Scott MacArthur, to answer engineering and design layout questions. They're much better suited than that. We have an agreement. They won't lawyer and I won't engineer. So if you have those questions, I will bring them up to answer those for you. Starting off with the performance standards that you've seen tonight, I would submit we do meet it. Um, your staff is correct in that this is a PUD combined with a subdivision, so first you need to examine the PUD, grant the PUD before you get to the subdivision standards because the subdivision standards are determined by the grant of the planned unit development. Regarding the utility in the parking, it's been proposed that it's inadequate by those individuals who have appealed. As you've seen tonight, it gives more than what your code requires in parking. It gives 2.9% street or 2.9 parking spaces per unit on the street. Um, if you don't include the parallel, and then there is some additional parallel parking that is not included. So the parking is met under your own code requirements. Um, moving on to transportation, um, your staff has found the transportation network is adequate and compatible with the south side of Ponderosa. I know that on the appeal it is suggested it is not because the Centennial Trail is there, but I would submit to you that any subdivision that crosses a sidewalk or the Centennial Trail is going to have pedestrian traffic and there are mechanisms to control that if the traffic study justifies it. In this case, your, your engineering staff has reviewed this and has not expressed a condition that they wanted placed on that. Had your engineering staff recommended that during the time that this was being proposed and staff was working with the applicant, you would have seen the applicant come forward with solutions suggested by staff. Um, council is urged to find that the 2014 traffic study is inadequate, but they're really, that's just a conclusory statement. You're not given anything that shows that it is inadequate. So just telling you it's inadequate without your staff expressing any sort of concern really is just a conclusion without any support. I've heard some discussion tonight about the scenic value of the Spokane River, and that is one of the things raised by the applicant. Um, your council is correct, as well as some of you on the council as you've discussed this, 
The scenic value of the Spokane River can be for the entire Post Falls community or for this planned community. In this instance, it's for the planned community. On the appeal, it is suggested to you that that violates your comprehensive goal of opening the Spokane River up. And not to be too lawyerly with you, but I'm sure your attorney has talked to you in the past about what we call exactions. And that's when you put conditions on development that requires a developer to donate something for the public good that doesn't alleviate an impact that they're causing. And it's the Nolan case from the United States Supreme Court. And a separate case called Dolan. I don't know why they rhyme. They just do. It makes it easy for us attorneys to remember it. But both of those cases held that you can't impose a condition on an approval to gain the public something that the public doesn't want to pay for. So if you're going to condemn a park for public use as a condition of approval, you would exceed the Supreme Court's um, parameters. And in fact, one of those cases, what was being proposed was that they require the applicant to give their oceanfront beach to the public. And the Supreme Court quickly said, that is too much. That doesn't alleviate any impact. Um, that leads into the park, and so I want to talk to you for a moment about the park. The park is usable. Um, Mr. Lanker is going to talk to you at the end of my presentation. It is flat. People can have access to the, to the river. If we did a traditional layout, I, I think we disagree with staff on what density would be. Mr. Lanker will talk to you that in his layout, had we done traditional lots, we would have had 48 lots. We're ending up with 47. So we see it as our planned unit development has reduced it by one. What we have done with the open space, in addition to making that open for that entire community to go down and enjoy the river, is the view corridor that we allow people from the river. So those of us who've lived in the area our entire life remembers the day and age you could go up and down the river. And there was very little homes on it, and it was pretty much in a natural strait. And and some of us enjoyed that more than seeing homes. Now, as development has occurred and you go up and down the river, it is house after house after house, except for when you hit those patches that haven't been developed or where there's a park, such as Kiwanis Park. This allows you to keep some of that natural state in the view corridor down by the river. And I would submit to you that that has a visual value to those of us who live within this community. Um, on, the, on the open space, which ties also to the park, we do exceed the 10%. I, I'm never great at math, that's why I'm not an engineer, but it's somewhere around 12% that we have for our open space. So we have tried to exceed the performance standard. Yes, some of it is a little steeper, but it does meet your open space requirements. Um, concerning compatibility, this is all R1, it's all an R1 zone. It's been suggested to you that some of our uses, which are the townhomes, are, would require a special use. And that's true unless you're in a PUD setting. When you're in a PUD setting, then it's either a permitted use or a special use is covered by the PUD approval. So we don't, we don't need a special permit first and then get the PUD. It's, it's all decided by you under that PUD umbrella. On those townhomes, I think that Mr. Lanker will talk to you the, more extensively on this, but there is, it, this is a gated community. There is a vegetative buffer between those townhomes. They're designed so that they share a wall and they each sit on their own lot. So there's a shared wall and a lot that each side sits on. And then council discern that that is not accessed from South Ponderosa Drive. Um, the biggest criticism of this subdivision that is substantive is it's hazardous. I would submit to you it's not hazardous as it exists today. The concern being expressed to you is that it will be hazardous as developed because of stormwater transfer and impervious surfaces. And I'll let my engineer address that. But the design system for the stormwater adequately addresses and controls that stormwater, and that is a condition of approval that you have, your planning and zoning 
and your staff have recommended for this, and it's completely an appropriate condition of approval that we agree with. But it is not the province at getting the entitlement stage of a development to put up our engineers and act like we're in court and have a you're right, I'm wrong conversation. The conversation with you as council is, can you impose conditions that staff can then supervise and assure are complied with to alleviate the concern of us creating a hazardous condition by requiring us to adequately impound and control our stormwater? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And if we don't present something that staff agrees with, staff will not approve it moving forward. So that condition of approval is the appropriate way of dressing that rather than us trying to have a mini trial tonight on whether or not it can be done. On your um, due process and those types of issues that the applicant has raised, if they raise them again, I will address them in rebuttal. And concerning some of these quality of life issues that I call it, they, they've raised, the homeowner's going to have to maintain their grinders pumps. And there's going to be snow on the roads that might use up some of the parking lots if we have a heavy snow. Those are quality of life issues, not really performance standards within the subdivision. Goodness knows that the year we had our eight foot unusual snow, none of us had parking on the road. We barely had parking in our driveways. That happens in North Idaho, but it's not a basis to deny a subdivision. And so I would suggest to council, that's a bit of a red herring to argue that you shouldn't approve something because the people who buy in there aren't going to be happy with how it's designed. If they're not happy with how it des is designed, they're not going to buy. Um, if there's some questions, I'm happy to answer them, and then I will ask Mr. Lanker to address the park and density. Go ahead, Steve. I had a question that uh, you brought up the issue of the park and the, the views and the site views from, say, the boulders going down the river looking back at this property. On your plan, I see it, it's hard to tell in the corner. It looks like there's a dock coming out, is that going to be, are they going to be applying for one dock permit, two dock permits, or are we going to see a line of dock? I'm going permits? to ask our engineer to answer that, Mr. Okay. It's hard would to you tell from me? this just how many docks might be planned for the, for the park there, which I think would affect the view lines a little bit. Hi. Uh, Scott MacArthur, MacArthur Engineering, PO Box 2488, Post Falls 83877. Uh, yes, yeah, so there will be docks. As associated with all riverfront development, there are uh, uh, docks, uh, dock slips available, and that is governed by the Idaho Department of Lands, which we have not made application for yet, pending the approval of this development. So, correct. Do you have an idea of how many docks? I know you'll go through another if you propose docks. You're going to have to we have another out, hearing. Uh, we haven't worked those. out the exact, uh, but it'll be in conformance with their requirements, and and you know, taking into account the adjacent landowners and their docks and and how that's placed. Al? To, to answer your question, uh, there, there is not an application for that yet, but yes, a dock will be, uh, or docks will be constructed. Okay, I, that is the only concern I have is because when you have docks and boats, it does affect, affect your view of the, the, the uh, property, the river frontage from the river. And, and just as the neighboring developments have docks and marinas and, and, and so on and so forth, this, dock, this land should be permitted as well for the same. Okay. I just want to get up front on that. Thank but you. It just shows the one picture, so it's... Yeah, you're good. Okay. Don't run off. I see Alan. another question. Don't run off. I got a question for you. <laughs> I was supposed Where's to be that? last. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, if you want to go... I no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, there was some uh, information in our packet regarding another engineer's... Uh, opinion I guess on some of the stormwater issues correct. and the, uh, the retaining wall correct so I would like to hear your okay uh, yes uh, mr. Coleman was hired by the uh, opposition to this development to analyze our conceptual design that is brought forth for this proposal uh, mr. Coleman you know I made some uh, he's, a, he's a great engineer he made some great comments and some great assessments it wasn't the, the conceptual design that was put forth was 
under the notion that yes, we would have a retaining wall design based on the soil analysis. We performed our geotech analysis on the site for not only the retaining wall, but also for stormwater. Uh, and that, that'll be submitted. There's a resolution with the city of Post Falls. It's resolution, uh, resolution uh, 2008-02, which is stormwater resolution. And our project cannot be approved by your staff until we meet those requirements. So any third party assessment, which I'm not typically uh, accustomed to, we don't get the uh, special assessment from another peer engineer. Uh, but you know, all, that, uh, all those requirements are, are brought forth to the city uh, and presented to staff and we have to meet all those requirements. And so if there's an issue with that presentation and what we've done so far, uh, they would have brought that to our attention and, and addressed that. So yes, it is my understanding that there is a stormwater concern and there's a retaining wall and there's a homeowners who live next door. Of course, they're going to be upset and concerned. But it's my job as an engineer and our design team's job uh, to put forth a product that meets all the city requirements. And when constructed, that, that will also have to meet requirements. It's not, we're not going to put a plan out there and then go do what we want. We have to be in conformance with those codes. And so we're coming forward saying, here's our project. This is our intention. Here's our design will come forward after we receive, hopefully receive approval from the city. Just curious on that retaining wall, how big is that? How tall is that? Well, it depends on how uh, a typical person would measure a revealed retaining wall. There's buried depths and different. Okay. Uh, but you're probably looking at a max height of about 10 feet okay. right. of, of visual wall in certain locations. And that's just, again, due to the, the topography of the property and why we designed the project the way we designed it. Uh, taking into account the highs and the lows and the fluctuating uh, topography as you get closer towards the river. Okay. I'm done. For now. Okay. I'm okay. For now. Yeah, 10 feet, excuse me, and it's 10 feet below, so they're not going to be looking at a wall. It's right. below. So it'll be pretty much at yeah, their Yeah, they'll grade. look out. They won't see a retaining wall. The wall will be saw, uh, visualized excuse from our me. side. Excuse me. Yes. So um, the applicant has four minutes and 52 seconds left. So no, she's <laughs> answering questions. So I turn off the timer when okay. the council has questions for okay. them. And I'll turn it but back they're on. done asking questions. Okay. So, okay. I'm done. Okay. For now. Thank you. So go ahead. I'd like to bring Glenn Lanker up. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, President Wilhelm and uh, other members of the council. My name is Glenn Lanker, and I'm the project architect and, and planner. My address is 1029 East Shadowwood Lane in uh, Coeur d'Alene. I need to, uh, let me call up this uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, we, uh, during the Planning Commission hearing, we, we put together a presentation and went over it in detail, and I won't, I won't certainly go through that, but I do want to touch on a couple uh, questions and, and comments that were raised here and also during the appeal process. One of the, one of the critical things is uh, the density issue, and uh, in your packets, uh, we, we submitted, uh, our team submitted a letter on August 23rd that addressed um, a number of, of questions that had been raised. And in the, uh, in the attached to my particular letter with a, a number of issues that were responded to is a, uh, is a site plan that we did then submitted as an alternate under the conventional <coughs> zoning criteria under R1. So you, you should have that. Um, I don't have it on the slides here because it wasn't part of the original uh, presentation. But <coughs> we, we took 60-foot locks, 6,500 square feet, minimum 65-foot right-of-way, and so forth, and we were able to achieve uh, uh, 48 lots based on the conventional zoning criteria. It's important to point out because we are, with this PUD, we are seeking approval for 47 lots, which is actually less. The, the reason that's important to point out is that this could be achieved without a PUD, but then we would have to go in. The question, good question was raised, what is all the property developable? Certainly given the ability to, to, to utilize cut and fill and fill in the ravine and have some, a series of retaining walls. Uh, so this, this plan that you have actually privatizes the waterfront. There's no open space. It's all private lots and we can achieve one more lot than what we're seeking approval for. The, the, so the advantage of the PUD, besides the criteria that staff mentioned, in, in this case is to, is to create some open space that is, um, uh, let me just go to that site plan. 
is, is create open space that is where we can do some things like preserve some existing topography. That ravine will have a, a path, a pedestrian and cart path down to provide ADA access down to the, to the common space. Uh, for the neighborhood down at the water, we'll be able to preserve trees. Uh, so that, e even though a, 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 some, t some land is, is sloped, it certainly can be developed. In fact, we've got some specific units designed that would accommodate the slope. Uh, let me just get there. This is an example of, of one of those unit types. So we can privatize and create buildable lots where there is slope, but the whole intent, and, and it's reflected in this, in this design, is to minimize the footprint and minimize the site disturbance, number of retaining walls, preserve trees, and preserve this access, common access down to the, to the waterfront. So that's important to point out. The other, the other important uh, consideration is that uh, infill development is important. I think something that, that the city is, is, uh, uh, is rightly pursuing and reasonable to be able to use existing infrastructure without having to extend it to outlying areas. And this is a good example with the existing water and sewer and road improvements. Which, uh, Susan talked about parking. Um, the, uh, the approach that we, it was brought up, community design. What we're doing here is, is what's called a traditional neighborhood development. There's a lot of advantages to that. One of them is where we, we have the garages at the rear of the homes primarily, except for the street, the, the one, uh, the, the few houses on the east side. But everything else has a garage at the rear, so you can put the trash cans back there. It allows us to have an additional guest parking space. And then the other thing that's important, it actually allows greater, our setbacks are greater between the houses than what conventional uh, zoning would allow. We have a minimum of 15 feet. It's going to be typically more like 16 feet between the houses. In a conventional subdivision, you can have a five foot setback, which is a total of 10 feet. So there's a lot of reasons that this enhances the streetscape rather than have the, the curb cut up with driveways and, and garages that dominate the streetscape. We, we, it allows for street tea, trees, on street parking, and a lot more pet, uh, pleasant pedestrian environment in terms of the, the, the uh, one, one quick point about the public access to the waterfront. Um, that is a comp plan, but as we understand, the, 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 this project will have common open space, but for this neighborhood, can you imagine if, those, what, if it was open to the public, the traffic and the parking concerns that would be raised, so that would be really counterproductive to what, what we're trying to do and create a, a beautiful open space, but not, not uh, exacerbate those problems of traffic and parking and the impacts to this, not only this neighborhood, but everybody else. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have questions? Anybody have questions for the applicant? I do. Okay, go ahead, Al. I guess it goes back to that 48 lot design. Yes, sir. That would totally comply with the existing zoning of- Absolutely, it, and I, I don't know if you can find it, but it, it is attached to the back of that August 23rd letter. And every, it meets all the criteria, the minimum lot width, which is 60 feet, minimum lot size is 6,500 square feet, or yeah, the, 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 right, the right of way, 65 feet allow, that's a city standard for swales and sidewalks and everything. And then it allows, um, it, but it, it would basically wall off the, the waterfront for just those few private lots, which is typical what's, what's in the, the neighboring subdivision and others, it, is the waterfront is totally privatized and nobody can access it except those people. So this is an alternative that's, that's conventional that we feel is inferior and it would, it would take a lot of grading and cut. we'd have to cut down all the trees and do significant grading, but it, it can be done and we can fit 48 and meet the existing subdivision criteria. Yes, sir. Thank you. I got you. Steve. So if you went with the 48 feet, then you wouldn't have the, the distance between the houses and you'd go back to the minimum five feet and? Yes, sir. All, all the things that we're doing to enhance the, the design of the community and neighborhood would go away. We'd have, the houses would be close together every lot would have the garage on the front, so you'd have a driveway, just like a conventional subdivision. Our, our intent is to, is to enhance the quality of the neighborhood and the streetscape by putting the garages at the back, freeing up more room between the houses, and then also allowing, without driveway and curb cuts, you can fit more on street parking, parallel parking, and you can have street trees at 30 feet on center, which we're committed to. So, um, and then real quickly, I wanted to mention, if I could, on, on Ponderosa, there'll be a, it's a gated community. There'll be a, a well-designed and built site-obscuring fence and a gate. 
a green belt buffer, then a private driveway before you get to those duplexes. There's quite a bit of a setback and a lot of elements that will actually uh, obscure those units from view. So there won't be anything open on Ponderosa. Uh, follow yeah. up. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Follow up on my question then. Go ahead. Go ahead. On that then, would, you would add a lot more hardscape, which would lead to the potential probably more stormwater runoff? Actually, actually, the uh, street sections that we're, that we're proposing here, it is a city standard, it, but it allows parking on one side. Um, we, we do have, um, if you stop it, but actually, there, if you look at this, this is an important point. If you look at a conventional subdivision that has garages, and then you have to have a minimum 20-foot setback from the property line to the garage, you have a, an 18-foot wide driveway to serve that. If you were to take that amount of concrete and put it into the, the it's basically a long private driveway in terms of the alleys behind there, it's only 20 feet wide. The, the amount of concrete and hard service actually is less with, with the, with the, the uh, single loaded street section and all those driveways going away and the, the garages just being off the, the common alley. So there, isn't, there is no increase in impervious surface as far as uh, as far as with an alley loaded approach versus a, a, a front loaded, and, and by the way, the, the stormwater calculations all take that into account, and that Scott has, has done and, and add it more than adequately meet the city ordinances in, in addressing the stormwater uh, treatment. Alan, I did have another question. Yes, sir. On the west side of the property. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of, I don't know if you've got a picture of it. Sure. I'm, I'm concerned about the buffer between, or what goes between the major street, what your product is, and then is there an, I, the way I read this or look at it, there's an alley, and then is there any buffer between the alley and the property line? Yes, sir, there, that area won't require a retaining wall. It's relatively level. Uh, there is a landscape buffer between the alley and then a further setback to the, the house itself. So it's actually a further setback in a conventional development where you could put a house as close as 15 feet to the, to the property line. So those houses on the west side are going to be approximately how far from the west property line? Uh, well, let's see. I, the setback from the from the 20 foot alley to the garage is six feet, 20 feet, and I think it's about a six foot landscape buffer that will be that will have a site obscuring fence and trees along there. So whatever that total is, 20, 26, 32 feet from the property line before you even get to the house, whereas a rear yard setback would be what is the minimum, 15 feet, I think, in in an R1 zone. Okay. Um, Mr. MacArthur has a correction to that. We don't oh. want to mislead you. Yeah, there's a, there's a five foot setback between the alley and the property line. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a planner space. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done now. <laughs> okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay. Uh, next. Do you have, yes, sir. One quick question. I am not seeing in the record the alternative plat that was referenced and shown. Um, I don't see it anywhere in our record. I see the letter, but I don't see that as an attachment. So we would need to get a copy of that if you want to rely on it. And the council would need to consider whether or not that prejudices the other parties. We may want to give them a chance to review that and provide rebuttal at some point in the future. But I don't, if that's going to be admitted into the record. I don't see it here anywhere. Yeah, I'm sorry, but see it either. But there's 320 pages in my packet, so I might have yeah. missed one. Yeah, yeah, I'm flipping and flipping, and I'm not seeing it. It's not in the big. It's not in the. Big, it wasn't in the big packet. So. It, it could, we, could we have that that sure, you just you was Absolutely. showing, please? You bet. It was actually part of the supplemental submittal, as I said, August 23rd, that was turned in response to the uh, to the appeal letter. So I'll uh, I'll be glad to submit that, and so if that's okay. So is that something that staff would have got and reviewed and look or is this just something for our benefit so i see a letter but i don't see that attachment so i'm not sure when that would have come in it would have been a, a there was a letter from susan weeks with a letter attached from scott uh, and then see. an additional letter that same day from myself with the with the, there's a parking lot a parking calculation and then the uh that alternate plan. Yeah, I've, so. I've got the letter, but I don't see that attachment, so I'm not sure where that went. It doesn't show in the record. 
It, well, it's not in our packet, so if we could have a copy of that, sure. So that the. Um, you bet. I will. Uh, I'll take that. So I think. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on now. And um, Shannon, do we have anyone in favor? Yes. Do you want to call these out, or do you want me to read them? I'll do it. Okay, first we have Jim Grassi. He wishes to speak and he is in favor. Uh, Jim, just your name for the record, please. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. My name is Jim Grassi and I live at 730 North Coles Loop in Post Falls. Uh, my wife and I have been residents of Post Falls for 23 years. 16 of those years we've lived on the river. Um, my background is 10 years as a park administrator, so I'm very experienced in park planning, park design, as well as I was a city manager for 10 years in a small city in California that was like Post Falls used to be. And uh, so I appreciate the work that staff has done and that you all do more than most because having sat in front of councils before, <laughs> I know that uh, sometimes uh, people say things that you haven't said, and I appreciate what you do. Uh, I'd like to make four quick points. Uh, one, uh, who are the people who bring you this project, and uh, can they be trusted? And I know these people that are involved in this project, and I can assure you, you can trust them. Uh, architects and developers can get up and say things, but backing it up is a whole nother thing. Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. I suggest that if you review the record of the applicants and really know them, you will have the wisdom to see their impeccable record and integrity in development. Uh, you can know them and, and trust them. That's my opinion. Secondly, who are the possible residents who will reside on this property? Well, we don't know for sure, but I can tell you my wife and I would be two of those people, and I know four other people that are movers and shakers in this community, people that want to downsize like we do, that would delight in living in this community. They're local folks. What about the impact? I think having lived on the river, I can appreciate the potential impact of any development. This group has the experience of working in delicate areas and will treat the land and river with respect and will mitigate any of the potential problems that could come about. Some neighbors have, uh, in my opinion, used this property and I've walked it. Uh, area as their private park and they suggest that they would like to keep the property as is. Well the as is state is disease and dying trees are infecting the neighborhood, fallen timber from our recent storm uh, creating hazards for surrounding neighbors and trespassers and the impact of the vegetation on the river itself decaying and putting nutrients into the river. Uh, that's a biomass load of pollution in my mind. Also, having served for 10 years combined with the uh, Post Falls Police Department and the Kootenai County Fire as a chaplain and doing a lot of ride-alongs and going to a lot of fires, I don't want to speak for them. They can speak for themselves, but I can tell you in the ride-alongs that I've had, that area as it exists, as is, a potential hazard, a fire danger in terms of fueling the neighborhood for a massive fire, in my opinion, and I fought fires in the park district, and uh, it's a, right now a refuge for drug users that want to go to that area. Uh, let's compare to what the applicant has put forth. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Uh, this colorful landscaping, meandering stream, uh, and I think it has 
the potential of cleaning that site up, both from the river standpoint, where I'll be on tomorrow, as well as uh, the street standpoint. It's going to control the nutrients in my mind that impact the river. Uh, it'll enhance the value of the neighborhood. I can tell you, having lived uh, in Moraga, um, that when projects like this come up, usually the neighborhood values go up about 10%. Anyhow, I appreciate your consideration of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have uh, wishing to speak and in favor, favor, Rob Elder. You have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, President Wilhelm and Council. I appreciate speaking in front of you. Thank you. Um, I came up here with some things to talk about. And I really felt that I, I really want to share my heart. Um, you know, Jim, Mr. Grassi alluded to who is, is going to be living and who the players are that are doing this project from, uh, I'll be the real estate agent, God willing, hopefully, in this project. Local born and raised, your developers are local born and raised, Jay Enos and Team Blue Plank, over a thousand homes in our community, vested, rooted in this community. Thomas Tedder as well. Look what he has done to the factory outlets. He's made a factory outlets that we, we, we know for a long time we're doing nothing. These are amazing players, and I think it's important who we know is doing this development. You know, there, there's, as the mayor alluded as well, you know, things that are saying false truths. I mean, th this team of players, uh, we're about community. We're about building a great community. This is a, an amazing project that stands on its own merit. You know, I, I know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm in the shed, and I know it makes a great shed. It's solid tools, knowing who is in that shed, knowing that the people that are in there you can count on. They are going to do nothing. We are going to do nothing. I'm hopefully not going to sell or attract anybody that's not going to want to be part of a community. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not going to impact the community in any negative way. Our goal is through this whole project has to be, to be solid and to really do a great job with presenting a great product not for the money, not for everything that everybody seems to think that it's all about. Dwayne Hagedon, Bob Templin. Well, why do you say those names, Rob? For two reasons. One, um, it's tough for me to navigate a world without them here now. And two, I can't tell you how many meetings like this. This project reminds me of those where after it was over, the false truths and the things that were said was just, wow, their hearts were never in what everybody thought they were. Does that make sense? Same with this project. The hearts of these developers are to build a great product, a great project. All of us are going to live there, me included. Um, we're, the last thing we're going to do is do anything to jeopardize the neighbors. Many of you I know personally on Ponderosa, the elementary school down the street, everything is there. We're there to complement this place, make it a wonderful new existing community, and staff has done a great job, as you alluded to, 300 plus pages in your, in your packet, as they always do with homework about this project. Um, I, I, just, I just can't support it enough uh, because the hearts of these players are in the right spot. What we're trying to do here is a great project, enhance the property, um, everything about it I, I, I'm just very, very, very pleased with. And, you know, I just think it's important that everybody here know who's in your shed, know who you're really dealing with. The hearts of these developers are to do a really good thing in this community. Their track record proves it. We all have, have lived here. We all continue to live here. We spend money here. We take our kids to school here. We raise our children here. Been here my whole adult life. I chose to invest in Post Falls for 16 years with my restaurant. They're great people. It's an exciting project, and I would strongly encourage you guys to support that wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have anyone speaking neutral? We have none. Councilor Wilhelm, um, we now have copies of the alternate plat. We're going to hand those out to you. I'd like to request a five-minute break so we can set a copy back here on the DS before we move into people who are, are neutral or opposed so they have a chance to look at this and that way they can speak to this and raise any questions that they have. Okay, we'll adjourn for five minutes.
we'll move on. And uh, now the public. Linda's not on. Speaking in opposition, Shannon. You still got a red light here. All right. Oh. No, we're good to go. We're good. We're good now. Okay. The light's been on. The Thank you. Side. Her mic okay. wasn't on. So, wishing to speak, Megan O'Dowd. And Megan is going to be speaking for IAAR Idaho LLC, Post Falls Trust, Michael and Shel uh, Cheryl Palacero Family Trust. That's is that correct. correct? That is correct. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Thank you for your time. My name is Megan O'Dowd. I represent the three homeowners um, uh, that Madam Chairman just uh, uh, recited. They are the uh, most adjacent three lot owners on the southeastern boundary of this proposed project. So Council already has our detailed objection letter that was filed September 10th. I am more than happy to go through those technical arguments and answer any questions that you have. I am hopeful that our engineer, Jim Coleman, calls in. He is on a uh, trip to the deep backlands of Alaska and uh, was trying to get internet access to remote in to help answer technical questions, but his technical report is also in the record. So um, we'll do the best we can without him. So um, the, we're, we would ask council again tonight to uh, deny this application. My uh, objection letter goes through a variety of detailed reasons with the approval uh, requirements that uh, council must make and the reasons why that you, uh, from our perspective, council can't make those appropriate findings. One of the most important from our perspective is density. And I heard tonight a lot of discussion about R1 and what is the required density. Um, I, I would direct uh, council to look back in the, the record. Staff has gone on record before to say that a typical development usually gets about 3.8 units per acre. And that is because normally we have roads and sidewalks and other things that get dedicated to the public that can't be used. And that is what I would uh, suggest was normally on flat land. This is not a typical flat land on the prairie. Um, and and I will talk about this later, but if council doesn't uh, deny this tonight, I would wholly recommend a site visit. And that is appropriate with appropriate uh, notice provisions. And it's something that I participated in before. Because what this site is, and Mr. Coleman um, testifies to this in his opinion, and if, if council would pull up at some point the top, the topography maps that we have, they are in the record. And the lines of this will be very clear. This is a very, very steep site. We're talking 20 to 30% slopes existing. There are two natural drainage already happening from the surrounding developments. And there's already an existing culvert that gathers all of the drainage water from the um, property uh, to the north of Ponderosa Boulevard. And there are two natural drainage ways coming from the north as well as an existing drainage uh, pattern from the development to the east um, and coming down these big ravines. The, what, what they're doing here and what Mr. Coleman has said in his report is the 4.7 units per acre is not feasible. That might work on a standard prairie lot. This is not a standard prairie lot. We have the steep slopes, the existing drainages, and we have the Spokane River at the southern end of this thing. And, standard rules should not apply here. So, so that's kind of like the overarching, uh, I guess, idea that I would ask council to seriously consider. And, and that's uh, repeatedly what we discuss in our objection letters. Um, so the first thing we'd like to ask, assuming that council isn't prepared to deny this thing tonight, is I would direct council to the um, rebuttal documents filed by the applicant. Those are at PC 26, I think, in your packet. Um, the applicant's legal counsel, Susan Weeks, and the applicant's engineer, Scott MacArthur, both filed documents. Um, and in Mr. MacArthur's documents, those, again, are under P26 and on page, pages one and two of his report. So when he's, uh, and the purpose of those documents was to address the concerns that my clients raised before planning and zoning commission. They dealt with the retaining wall, the drainage concerns, uh, they were, there were a multitude of them, but those are some of the specific ones that Mr. MacArthur addresses. And in this 
rebuttal document, he uh, references, uh, based on the findings from a geotechnical engineering report we had prepared by Liberty Geotech, which we received on April 12, 2021. Um, and as a result of that internal geotechnical report, they actually modified their retaining wall. That's what they've said here. They refer to this geotechnical report um, with, res with response to the retaining wall, dry well concerns, stormwater concerns. And I asked city when we read this and when Mr. Coleman, who is also a city attorney and has um, worked in this community for well over 30 years, he said, oh, I need to see that uh, geotechnical report. It is not in the record. Okay, so we can't respond to it. City staff can't respond to it. So the adequacy of them relying on those documents, I, I would suggest is not sufficient right now. At a minimum, I would ask that, that the council table this, allow uh, applicants to submit that so it's in the record, so that staff, council, the public, we can all look at this. Because our engineers, our clients, the ones that are arguably the most impacted, have not had the liberty to see this document, which they purport resolves all of our concerns. And it's just not fair to us to be able to say if that's true or not when we haven't seen it. So that's, that's the first thing I would ask. Um, the second is just the big picture of this site. So um, again, I, I think Council, when you, when you close public comment, I would, I would strongly urge you to pull up the visuals. Ask, ask staff to pull up the topos that are in this file. They show the natural drainage patterns, the topography. There are two, two ravines. I have not walked on it because it's owned by somebody else, but we, my clients own the next to it. We walked Ponderosa. This is a very, very difficult, challenging site. Mr. Coleman's professional um, opinion is that it is indeed a hazardous site and merits all of the things that come with a hazardous site. So what would that mean? Geotechnical report, absolutely. And at this stage, what, what applicant is asking for is that, yeah, yeah, we'll do those things later on. And I would agree. On most standard developments, waiting until you're submitting building plans or site disturbance permits, that might be appropriate. But this is not a standard site. And we have got to look closely at it now before there's an entitlement. Because once council approves this, you get 47 units. And, and we put the car before the horse, and we can't really unwind that. And uh, so, so the types of things that we would look at are uh, ask for the geotechnical report. Have, have the engineers ask for the detailed construction plans. It's absolutely within the authority of the city to ask for those types of detailed documents, detailed landscaping documents, detailed erosion control plans, stormwater plans. Um, some of those they have submitted, but not completely. But we definitely don't have a geotechnical report. We do not have uh, construction plans. Construction plans are so critical because of this retaining wall. I, I heard it mentioned that maybe it's like 10 feet. Our, I think their materials actually suggest it's closer to 13 feet. My client's property is gonna be right next to these retaining walls. Again, how, how can I assure my clients that this is not going to fail? That it's when, when I have our engineer looking at these things saying, this property cannot withstand a 100 year fl flood event. And when that happens, Water's going every there, everywhere and things will give out. Properties will flood, retaining walls will go underway. Those are assurances that my clients are entitled to. And we should go through those now before the appro approval happens so we can make sure. And, and frankly, uh, in the rebuttal documents, they actually said, well, Jim Coleman was right about some things and we adjusted them about the retaining wall. Well, again, like, shouldn't those all be happening now? Shouldn't we assure, I, I agree, they, these folks have uh, property rights, absolutely. But so do my clients. And one of the things Jim raised in his last um, rebuttal was that the way they're building this retaining wall, it's actually going to encroach. They're going to have to encroach on our folks' property to build it. That, that's, that's a direct infringement on my client's property rights. And we need the level of review, a, a very detailed level of review, to ensure that we can protect their rights as well. Um, So again, I think this is all about safety. Our concerns are about the safety of not only the future owners of this development, the safety of my clients, everyone within South Shore and the folks that live to the west. This, in the opinion of our engineer, is simply too dense. It, and again, I, I recognize that R1 allows for a certain level of density, but that 
assumes perfect conditions. This site is not a perfect condition site. It is very unique. And the applicant, I mean, that word unique is riddled in this record. Uh, staff say it repeatedly. The applicant recognizes it's a very unique site. We cannot treat it like a standard site and think everything's going to be just fine. So based on the objections that we have and, and the failure to meet the technical components of the subdivision and the PUD plans, there are, we think that there are other issues, procedural deficiencies. We, we, our review of the code absolutely requires a special notice for townhomes. I mean, there, there are other very equally important things that we think are enough to deny this application. If the council's not inclined, we would just request that it be tabled with directions to city staff to require these additional documents. Let's get the geotech report in the record. Let's get construction plans. Let's get all of these detailed plans and then come back so before you guys make this very important long-lasting decision, you really do have all the information. And after you get those detailed informations, one more step is to schedule that site visit. You can have a site visit. I mean, Idaho Supreme Court law does allow it. There's special notice that you have to do. I mean, you have to have clerks and counsel and everybody there and allow that. But that would be very telling and informative to this council so they could see firsthand just how unique this property is and why we can't apply the one size fits all approach for this project. So I'm open for questions on any of my objection documents or the rebuttal. I, I don't know if Jim Coleman is available or online. He's not. Okay. Um, yes. So what? Basically, uh, Mr. Coleman hasn't had a chance to review the new geotechnical report, or has he? He, he has not. It's not. I, I contacted the city attorney and asked for a copy of it. It is not city confirmed. It's not in this record. So to my knowledge, I don't think the city staff or any, anyone has seen this as, as a matter of a, as the public record, as far as I'm, maybe Mr. Wilson could weigh in. Yeah. So to my knowledge, we have not received a copy of the reference report. Um, I would say that we don't control what documents the applicant chooses or doesn't choose to submit into the record. That's up to the applicant to decide how they carry their burden of proving whether or not they meet the application requirements. Um, to date, we have not received that. It's, we haven't, and any reference to it um, we couldn't rely on those references to carry the burden of proof because it's not in the record. So any, any reference that says this report shows that we can do it, that's essentially an unsubstantiated reference to a document that we don't have. So it would be entitled to lesser weight than if we had the report. Having said that, we, again, don't control what people submit into the record. That's up to them to figure out for themselves. Alan? I have a question for you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> you used the word unique several times, non-standard property. It could be, though. Well, I'm not an engineer, so I, I, won't, I, won't, answer, I won't answer that. Um, unique was actually, I think, the words that the applicant uses huh? and, and staff as well. Um, my point, and I think Jim makes this point in his rebuttal documents, is that you cannot treat this like one of the flat prairie pieces that that you can just say oh yeah standard density is this let's here's our buffer here's our setback y you know we're, we're having to pump sewage out from every individual lot because our slopes are so extreme that you cannot gravity feed these things you have um, a design going down down existing I mean there's an existing culvert ga gathering stormwater from all of these properties to the north that's sitting there right now today and if it was raining, it would be flowing water through it. And it's at 20 to 30% slopes, and it abuts the Spokane River. <laughs> I mean, and I don't think it's standard in any development to have 12 and 13 foot retaining walls, and particularly not to adjacent landowners. I mean, we made, and I'll just add it here quickly, um, the transportation layout of this project is very unique. We actually made records requests for all of the subdivisions approved over the last like 24 months to just get a sense. And this layout is very unique, and, but in a bad way. It's very damaging to the adjacent landowners. We have East Ravine Drive abutting our property boundary the entire length rather than, I mean, they could have flipped it and put it down the ravine and had backyards back there. And, and my folks would much rather be looking at a backyard than at a, at a street landscape and parking 
parked cars and things like that. But it's, it's not a, when I say unique, it's not a standard flat lot. It is very steep. It is next to the Spokane River, existing drainage pat patterns that most of those things just don't exist on, on an average piece of property. Okay. Anyone else? I just, could you elaborate a little bit more on the retaining wall for me? Because it looks like when I read through it, the retaining wall would be put in for the protection of the existing neighborhood. Well, sure. I mean, it's there, and I wish Jim was here, and I'll, I'll defer to what he said in his opinion letter, because he's the only engineer here. Um, but sh sure, I mean, I think retaining walls are there to help preserve, right, the integrity of the land. I think Jim's concern was to build a retaining wall that large, that tall, would require a substantial, and the reason it has to be that tall is, again, because of the topography. We're talking huge variations in slope. And they're, they're trying to level that out to make a road that meets your guys' slopes and your other requirements. Um, but to shore that up and to make sure it doesn't, you know, all fall over, you, you have to do retaining walls. And uh, Mr. Coleman's concern is, especially with stormwater, there is not, there's too much impervious space and not enough swales and um, a drainage area to gather that. So when, when these huge storm events happen, that water is going to flood. That, I mean, Jim, I, again, I wish, I, I, I will say one thing. He said, if I was approving this project, I would be, it would keep me up at night. I mean, and I, that means a lot from Jim. He, he has approved these things. He is genuinely concerned that this project is too dense based on the type of pe property it is. There's too much impervious space, not enough swale. I mean, one of the ideas we tossed around um, with Jim was, you know, would it be different if the road was down at least the drainage or the, the bottom of the ravine? And he thought, yeah, that at least then you can you have more natural control of where water is going. But when you redesign everything on a site, there's only so much engineering I think you can do. From his perspective, it's it, there, you can't do enough to, to protect, in particular, my clients who live right next to this development. But I won't use his words. He, read his read his rebuttal. He does a better job. Anyone else? I've got just one last one last question. On the stormwater runoff, right now when I read in the packet that there is a stormwater drain, but that pipe has been crushed, and so that the stormwater now is just basically going on the entirety of the lot, or is it going down the ravine, or so would this project help? clean up some of those stormwater issues, so. I guess, and I'll, I'll, applicants certainly will have their own thoughts. I, I'm not sure which storm drain they're talking about. There is a culvert that runs, an existing culvert that runs underneath Ponderosa, and, and there's an existing pipe that, to my knowledge, is not crushed and is continuing to divert water, but I, I don't. And, and they mentioned that that would, I mean, it's in the plans that that would be maintained. It would have to be, there's prescriptive rights for, for that drainage. Control that with this one. Everybody okay? Yeah, go ahead. Anything else? Thank you all. Okay. No, nothing further. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Okay, well, I think I'll go through the ones who don't want to speak first and read what they have to say. So, um, not wishing to speak in opposition is Jerry Everhart on Woodcrest. This development does not fit with existing houses and is in variance with fire codes and zoning codes. Next, does not wish to speak in opposition is Kathy Everhart doesn't fit the surrounding area and too dense for the space. Uh, does not wish to speak and is in opposition. Kathy, <coughs> excuse me, Kathy Heron. I am opposed because of density and additional traffic. It does not match the area. Uh, this one doesn't say if you want to wish to speak or not. It says, in opposition, Christine Hansen and Jean Colley. 
you want to speak? Okay, I'll read what it says. It says, school children problem traffic. They live on Ponderosa Loop. I uh, do not wish to speak in opposition. <clears throat> Victoria Julin on Shore Pines Court. Traffic non-conforming to surrounding area. Uh, does not wish to speak in opposition. Charles Julin on Shore Pines Court. Traffic infrastructure disruptions does not fit the character of the existing neighborhoods does not wish to speak and is in opposition. Lewis Rudder on Triumph does not match the area, causes increased traffic on the river and on the street. Jessica Toliners does not wish to speak, is in opposition. We are opposed to this because it is not consistent with the surrounding area. If it is allowed here, it could result in all of the annexed properties to be high density on Ponderosa. Does not wish to speak and is in opposition. Robert McBride on Forest Glen. Robert doesn't give a reason. Uh, does not wish to speak in opposition, Terry Call. There is not enough research done on how the project can sustain 47 houses. There is no allowance. There is no uh, something about the ravine drainage and how it flows under Ponderosa north to south concerned about flow of neighborhood drainage into the ravine. Uh, in opposition, not wishing to speak, Linda Hudek on Ponderosa Loop. We oppose high density multi-unit housing in this subdivision. <clears throat> Darren Toliners on Forest Glen does not wish to speak and is in opposition. This project does not match our surrounding area. It also creates traffic hazard for students coming from Ponderosa Elementary School. Christine, mm, excuse me, Christine, I might butcher this. Uh, Fakery, Faker, something, I don't know. She is on um, Vellner Place. She is in opposition, does not wish to speak. We are opposed to the new development. It is such a small area for all those houses. Our area cannot handle all the growth. And this must be her husband, Ryan Farik. Oh, I think that's right. Okay, uh, is in opposition, does not wish to speak. We are opposed to the density of homes proposed for the site and the potential damage that it threatens to other homes in the area. Mark Stein is in opposition and does not wish to speak. Fawn Owens on Shore Cove is in opposition, does not wish to speak. This is an unreasonable proposal. We have way too much development as it is. Our schools and hospital are bursting. The high school is overcrowded. 47 homes on 11 acres is completely absurd. Way too condensed. I will bring, it will bring too much traffic especially by a school. Vote no, please and thank you. Stephanie Elo, no in opposition. It seems like Post Falls City has lost its clarity. All the building going on and the density is extremely concerning. I've raised my children here, but the way things are going, I'm not sure I want my grandchildren raised here. We lost or are fast losing our small town feel. 
please hold the developer to the original pro pro proposal for this project. It breaks my heart to see multi-unit buildings being built 30 feet from railroad tracks. Please don't wreck our city further. Thank you. Uh, Marie Stein is in opposition, does not wish to speak. Impact to area overcrowded school traffic increase. Blaze Elo votes no in opposition, does not wish, wish to speak. There, <clears throat> excuse me. There is no rhyme or reason to the insistent development of my hometown. I actively consider the option of finding a new home as the fear of an enormous apartment complex sprouting up beneath my house overcomes me. There was a beautiful forest on Spencer just a year ago, and it has been demolished and replaced with a complex. T. Chestnut does not wish to speak and is in opposition on Rivercrest. Too, too many people and homes in the development have been living in my home for 41 years on the corner of Ponderosa and Rivercrest by the grade school. That street has become too busy with just normal development. We can no longer have windows open at night, too much traffic and noise. <clears throat> does not wish to speak in an in opposition. Cynthia and Manuel Cora. Correa. Thank you. If you'd like to come up to the microphone, ma'am, you'd have to go on the record. Please come on up. They have to be able to record what you say. I'm sorry. Um, just go ahead and state your name right there. Cynthia Correa. And the reason why I didn't want to speak is because we recently moved over there. And unfortunately, the reason why we moved on this side or on this specially neighborhood is because um, that's around this. We moved from a place where they start building so much the traffic is horrible, kids not safe anymore, and unfortunately we're moving to a place we're supposed to be quiet for us as seniors. I love the kids passing by for school, safe, the parents are not walking with them, but if they start building so much, it's not gonna be safe uh, neighborhood anymore. A lot of traffic, I live on Ponderosa, and that is not, <laughs> To me, it's like a nightmare. I'm moving from one place to another to get away from all the traffic and everything, and I'm going to move to a place where it's going to be the same. So, unfortunately, I know it's, uh, the people want money, but we have to think that money is not the issue. It's our safe, safety for our kids, that neighborhood, and that's all I can say. Thank you. Okay, um, Tammy Godfrey does not wish to speak, is in opposition, she's on Forest Glen. The committee isn't looking out for the best interest of the people who live here. Why are these decisions made by a handful of people and not the vote of the people? We need more stores to buy food, etc. Alan Kyle on Stonebridge Court is in opposition and does not wish to speak. Trudy Gilbert is in opposition, does not wish to speak. No to more congestion in our neighborhood. I enjoy the peaceful and quiet and not too much traffic, which could all change because not only this development, but the apartment rentals that are now available. Sabrina Pen 
Pentbone, Pent, I think, uh, does not wish to speak, is in opposition. I do not think such a high density development belongs in this neighborhood. It will impact all the neighboring homes negatively through traffic, demand on utilities and city services. It should be a development similar to those already in existence. Bernice Kobizak on Greenbrier Court is in opposition and does not wish to speak. Um, are the politicians getting paid off for this? <laughs> okay. It doesn't match the area and will make traffic dangerous. I, for one, don't appreciate that comment, but anyway, we'll move on. Uh, Ruth uh, Burdick on Fraser is in opposition and does not wish to speak. I feel that this is a bad area to build above the homes on the river. I understand that there will also be boat docks next to some of the homes on the river. This is not fair to the homeowners on the river. Not wishing to speak and in opposition, Shirley Dila on Fraser Drive. Due to the runoff caused by boat docks in residential area homes, this can cause several different problems to the homeowners that live right on the waterfront down below this project. <clears throat> Angela is on Shore Pines, is in opposition, does not wish to speak. Um, L-N-O-U-Y-E, I apologize, I don't know how that's pronounced. This proposed development, Blue Plank, does not fit with the surrounding area. Approval of this will set precedent for high density housing in a single home community, thereby decreasing, decreasing property values. Not only that, but the community cannot absorb the proposed increase in traffic. The city of Post Falls has allowed the addition of several high density communities for which Post Falls does not have the infrastructure to accommodate. Please stop the uncontrolled growth in our area. Uh, not wishing to speak and in opposition, Aliyah Al-Rashadi on Shore Pines. And Dana Al-Rashadi in opposition, does not wish to speak. There needs to be responsible growth in this community and not shoving everyone in on top of each other at the expense of everyone else's property. If my property values are not important to the city, then obviously my vote isn't either. If my property floods due to negligence of the city, don't think I won't be suing. Um, this is a maybe wishing to speak, and it's Kathleen Campman. Kathleen, do you want to speak? I'm a Libra, so I just came to find out both sides of this um, because I've heard so many different ideas about this and everything. If you'd like to speak, ma'am, you're you're welcome to come come up. Because <laughs> I can't understand you with the mask on. <laughs> and just your name for the record. My name is Kathleen Phillips Campman. Um, I came here tonight because I'd heard, I've heard pros and cons. Uh, first of all, I am not against development, never have been. I was a, um, I planted myself here 32 years ago and raised my children. Um, when I moved here, there was lots of forest area in, in this neighbor, in our neighborhood over there, over on Ponderosa, and the Spencer wasn't supposed to be built on on the back side. Well, guess what? A few years after I moved here, Spencer got built. The new development right off Ponderosa, the little cul-de-sac area, that wasn't supposed to be developed. Guess what? Got developed. Five years after I moved here, we had to go to um, 
double schooling or whatever, what did we call it? Split the, shifts. Split, split shifts. shifts, thank you. Welcome. Where my kids had to go either from six in the morning until noon or one until six at night because we couldn't handle the amount of building that was going on in our area. Well, I see that happening all over Post Falls now. And my concern is, are we doing this um, around a proper infrastructure when I have to sit on Celtis and 41 for three lights before I get to go through there's something wrong there that's not how it should be when I talk to firemen who say we're not housed in our fire departments well enough to handle what we have and we just keep throwing more and more things I was told there was going to be this apartment complex put on this property I'm not seeing that. I'm not hearing that right now. So I came because I was curious. I care about this community. I've lived here for 32 years. I just want it to be done properly. I want to be able to handle the, the developments. This does sound like a high density um, area. I have walked that, that field with my dog, with my children. I know it. It is steep. It is interesting. I don't know. You called it unique, or everyone's calling it unique. I don't know about that, but all I know is it lost a hell of a lot of trees last year with the big storm. All those trees. It is. It seems hazardous in there to me. I mean, I won't even go in there now. So, I just, I just want to make sure we're doing it properly. So that's why I came tonight. I wasn't sure if I wanted to speak or not, but I did. So, that's all. thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, wishing to speak in opposition, Monty. Come on up, Monty. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce your last name either. And just your name for the record, sir. Actually, he was supposed to go first. <laughs> oh, Monty. sorry. <laughs> I'm Monty Meltebarger. Thank you, President Wilhelm <laughs> and Council. Having been uh, in construction with an A licensed in Southern California and a construction manager and also I owned an MJM engineering consulting firm so I was in a lot of these types of meetings. Um, I can tell you right now you're working with some of the best engineers around. I've worked with some of them myself. Um, they know what they're doing. But in this particular case, having watched Southern California grow up, because that's where I also grew up, I've seen the communities, the <clears throat> planned communities, truly planned. In Orange County, California, they did a fantastic job once they learned of what not to do. And in this case, I have to say that the density of this particular project is too much with the, the, the mixture that you have in there compared to what the surrounding area is around. In the hundreds of communities that I worked in in Southern California, the ones that worked the best were always the ones where they sticked with the, stuck with the same amount of square footage, you know, within the 3,000 to 4,000 square foot, 2,500 to 3,500 square foot, that type of thing. You don't go from 1,400 square feet all the way up to 4,000 square foot on the, on, the, on the coat, whatever it is. It doesn't work in that area. Plus the density of it for that area there is going to be massive for the buses that are going along there already with the type of kids. But then what's going to happen that happened in Orange County in places is the outside, those, those smaller units there, they'll, they'll be the ones that go first they'll start falling apart. It won't be like the deluxe ones that are, as you move in, you get better lots here. I think it should be a different type of density. That's the only thing that I'm opposed to because the engineers and people you have working on this project, they know what they're doing because I built Monte Vista Villas where I did have a big slope. Those block walls work if they do it right. These engineers aren't gonna screw up on that. I can tell you that. I just need, think you need to slow down on this one. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, next up and does wish to speak is in opposition, Bob Flowers. Uh, 
<clears throat> Bob Flowers, good evening, Council, Council President. Um, let's get this red herring or whatever you want to call it out of the way first. One, this was never submitted to the city as far as getting any approval on anything. And to this, in my personal opinion, and that's all it is, is a scare tactic to try to scare people away from what they really want. This could not be approved. I don't care how many times it, it, they tried to submit that particular plan. Let's talk about Ponderosa, a beautiful, peaceful street. It has, the traffic has been getting worse I just live a couple blocks from Ponderosa. That area was zoned R1. And if you talk to your building department, your planning department, and ask them on a typical R1 subdivision, what they'll make, what they can actually get in there between the streets and the setbacks and the swells and everything else, they'll tell you between 3, 3.8, 3.5, right in there, which is considerably less homes than what this thing is showing. To be realistic with things it's just too much too soon and the, this particular piece of property I would agree with the attorney earlier that you folks should put this hearing on hold and walk it walk the piece of property yourselves get a look at it to really get a feel for what it's too damn steep to be putting all them houses in there. It's, it's just wrong. And it should not be dumped on the neighbors in that area. It's supposed, if I read your comp plan and the requirements correctly, it's supposed to blend in with the existing community. This does not or the plan that they're coming up with does not blend into that neighborhood in any way, shape, or form. It just, it doesn't. And I just don't believe that a PUD is suitable for this area now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Next up, wishing to speak in opposition is Roger Duke. Roger, if you could just... State your name for the record. Hello, my name is Roger Duke. I live at 504 South Shore Pines Road. Thank you for coming and being here and allowing this. Um, I would, just to cut to the chase, I would immediately uh, cancel the PUD. My history is, uh, I have 35 years as an LA City firefighter, and uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of big time issues. I don't wanna anger anybody from the county fire department in this vicinity, this area, but the fact that they waived off their access, uh, they gave away their access points is horrific. Um, I spent my career, except for the two years that I spent as a training officer, uh, re recruit training, I spent them in the fit busiest fire stations in the city. And our busiest fire stations would probably, in a month, go to fires that these guys would go to in like 10 years. And I'm not bragging, that's just the difference in the, in the uh, busyness of the areas. So, access. Your access that you're uh, gonna allow if you allow this PUD, you are going to see, I don't even know if these gentlemen out here, and I, I have all the respect for what they wanna do and for what they try to be and, and aspire to be, I'm sure they're really good people, but they haven't had the life experience to make sound judgments on what you guys are building here you are overcoming them immensely with what they can do. I had a fire station with three fire companies and two rescue ambulances. I responded to an area that had about 90,000 people in it. 
which was absolutely inappropriate. But I also had another fire station about two miles away. And I had another one about two miles away in the other direction. Another one about two miles away in the other direction. We had massive amounts of people we could pour on fires. We were a class one department. We had huge infrastructure of uh, hydrants, main sizes, and rigs and people and training. If you guys have a fire of any significant size in those areas, you're going to lose people. I can guarantee it. I used to see developments like this in the Silmar and Pequim area go down. The city council have approved it for whatever reason. They approved it. I'd watch them build it. I was there for nine years. It was the busiest fire station in the city. I would go watch them build it, and within a year or so, those access points that they said were good, which are not as good as what you have here, or which were better than you have here, they didn't exist because there was cars parked there, there was trash cans out there, there was people working on stuff, and we'd stack up, and I ended up taking dead bodies out. That's the real out. That's the reality of it. That is the reality of it. Also, your density issues here in this city. I'm like that. These many people that came up here. Density does not lead to goodness. When I left the training academy in 1978, no recruit firefighter was stationed in the San Fernando Valley. San Fernando Valley was about 25 miles by 14 miles across. Our density at that time was about 325,000 people. The last nine years of my career as a fire officer, I transferred to the San Fernando Valley because that was the busiest place in the city. And we had about one million people. And in 1982, the mayor and the city council, for whatever reasons, rezoned the valley. And we are no longer sitting on 85 foot by 125 foot lot lines, right? All of a sudden, three story, two story, high density condominiums, townhouses, common wall was the rule across the San Fernando Valley. And with that came ruin. The density equals everything that you do not want to have happen here. I would ask you, I'm just asking for my heart, get control of it. You can build this place out to be a beautiful, beautiful place. But don't let the developers make the calls. You need to think about it because you are, you are creating a design for disaster. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. No clapping. <laughs> Thank you. I don't really care if you clap or not. Okay. Okay. I was just trying to act like Mayor Jacobson. Um, okay. Next up. Uh, wishing to speak and in opposition, Dan Leary on Shore Pines. Just your name for the record, please, Dan. And, and uh, I'm Technic Bob's channel, so could I provide you some pictures to look for reference on what I'm discussing? Mayor, I mean, you've seen them before, Warren. There are pictures of before. Hand them, just hand them to. I'm just, there's three of them here, and there's two pictures for each part. So, and I'm going to reference them as I. As I speak. So, uh, in December of uh, 2019, the planning and zoning hearing regarding the annexation of this North Shore property in the city, and I believe everyone thought that this would be zoned and built under an R1. I'd like to read a transcript from the deliberation at the time of that hearing. Campy, this, this makes good sense. I'm sure that what they want to do here is an R1, nothing else. Kerry, I agree with Campy on this one. Latham. I am for the annexation. I personally feel like there should be something in between an R1 and an R1S because in an R1, they can only bring the law sizes down to 6,500 square feet. I think this should be a quarter to a half an acre. Davis, isn't there something geographical conditions with that slope to make it almost impossible to go maximum density or am I wrong? Manly, that is correct. Cafferty, I think the question is, can you put less than 7,000 square foot lots on all 10 acres with the slope that exists. Manly, you can do nothing less than 6,500 feet. This is the deliberation at the time of the annexation. <coughs> now, we fast forward to the hearing for the planning and zoning regarding the PUD, the PUD, sorry. You probably heard or read the uh, basis for most of the, the, the contentions as to why, and I'm not gonna go through that again. I assume everybody knows as far as the, um, you know, the amount of homes in here, the, the townhouses, we've all heard it before and you've read it, I'm sure. But primarily, the, the real concern here is obviously with the amount of homes, the size of the homes, and the size of the lots. And I think that's what has to be addressed here. And after all the deliberation that we did at the planning and zoning meeting, there was not one moment of deliberation or explanation to us as to why they reverted, they reverted their decision from what was done in 
2019 to this time why they approved that PUD. Um, at the conclusion, but a couple of days later, we get, I got to read in the Coeur d'Alene Press where the head of the Planning and Zoning Committee makes a comment to their reporter, specifically to this hearing of the Planning and Zoning of the PUD, that there was a need to create a path forward. For whom? Um, my property is adjacent to this property, and a few years ago, I made contact with Th Thomas Tedder, and this was before any of these hearings, so it wasn't some conflict I was trying to, trying to make. And I expressed concerns over some trees on his property. Tom Rosa trees that were really tall, were beginning, leaning over my property, potentially with a good storm, were going to, to strike my home. So I addressed that with him, and his response to me was that he had discussed this with his father-in-law, who was involved in the logging business, and they decided that the trees were not only healthy, but more importantly, uh, and to the issues here today, he stated that due to the terrain and the slope at the location of these trees, it would be too dangerous and too costly to bring equipment to remove those trees, okay? But it appears this path forward that everybody wants to create has made this less dangerous and more feasible for him to remove these trees and more trees is he's going to put a road in there, he's gonna put this off-street parking that you're seeing in the second picture. Seven, there's gonna be seven parking areas right behind my house there's going to be a road right behind all the houses on the east side of this, okay? And when the applicant alluded to these tree houses that are going to be up here, right across the street from my house is also going to be six, uh, half a dozen garages, and then the houses are set back. So I get the glory of seeing a, a road, a bunch of cars stacked up for off-road housing, off housing, and then I get to see these garages. Now tell me where that is consistent with something in the neighborhood, or anywhere in Post Falls for that, for that matter. So um, I guess, you know, and again, somebody said it's going to enhance our value. If you think that looking at that is going to enhance the value of my property, I don't think so. Matter of fact, there is one person in our neighborhood on the east side who has lost a sale because of this potential uh, development. Yeah, so, you're, yeah, excuse me, um, your time's up, but I have a question for you. Sure. What's this? That is, I'm sorry, just for explanation, this is currently what it looks like. Seven off street parking allowed there. And you all know that they're going to probably, you know, you've got Excuse me, so we're going to get you to step back to the mic so we can pick, it, pick up what you're saying. You've got a Thank mini you. slot here going from 60 to 35. You've got setbacks going from 10 to 5. So they're going to be putting their cars primarily in their parking lot. So what's really going to go in here? Everybody's got a boat, everybody's got a trailer, everybody's got ATVs. You know what's going to be junked up in these seven spots. It's not going to be off street parking. It's going to be what they need to put in there. So I got to look at this road right on my backyard, this off street parking, and then these six garages. Okay? So I guess what I'm asking is I keep hearing this we have to create a path forward. I am asking the city council to create a path forward uh, to the current homeowners in this area, reject the, the PUD, and develop consistency with the surrounding neighborhood. Okay, um, moving on. Um, wishing to speak in opposition, Josh Crothers. Hello, council and president. My name is Josh Crothers. Um, I live at 417 South Timber Lane. I live on the corner of Ponderosa Boulevard in Timber Lane, which this PUD is proposed to line up with. So I've got several issues, but I'm going to keep it to the one that bothers me the most. I don't like the high density. Um, you're going to turn Timber Lane into a thoroughfare for all those people coming and going because it's a quick shot to get to Greens Ferry by going north, leaving there. So you're going to turn our little quiet street of Timber Lane, which has lots of kids playing on it, lots of little kids, people, anyway, you're going to create a thoroughfare there for people coming and going. Now let's go to the, the drainage problem. I'm the one who has the culvert in the back of my yard, and that culvert collects water. So there's a French drain and a culvert the city put in before I ever moved there. I've lived there 16 years. The first few years I lived there, the city would come out for someone from the streets department. They would clear the drain in my backyard. They would do a visual inspection. Um, and they were aware of it, they were on it. 
If they didn't clear the drains, my backyard fills full of water until it does finally get to the culvert. And then that culvert drains underneath Ponderosa Boulevard to the subject property. I think in one of the engineering reports, it states an engineer looked at it and didn't see any water running out the other end. Well, it's not for a spring. It's not for a stream. It's for water. That is a natural drainage. So when they say they're going to fill in the, the ravine, I, I'm like, that is so unintuitive to me. You're, that is a natural drainage. Where is the water that fills up in my backyard, and another neighbor uh, shares that backyard with me, I don't know if they're here or not, where's our water going to go when they fill up the other side where the culvert is supposed to drain? I look at the, uh, I look at the map, and where that culvert is, there's going to be a duplexer or, or a townhome. So I brought this concern up to the city over the past few years. I brought it up at the last meeting regarding this project. No one's ever got back to me. I expected someone to knock on my door and say, hey, let's look at your culvert. What's going on here? There's been nobody. It's like this is getting swept under the rug. The city no longer comes out and monitors this drain, this culvert and the French drain. So I don't know what, what, what has gone on with this. I want to also say when I first moved in that house, I wanted to build a shop in my backyard. I was told by the city I couldn't because there's a drainage back there and an easement. So I don't know what's changed in 16 years from when I first made that request to what's being proposed here, but it's, it's ludicrous to me. Where is the water going to go from that natural drainage that goes under Ponderosa Boulevard and then down the steep ravine? Where is that water going to go? It pulls up quickly, and I'm, 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 I'm very worried about that. And no one, has, no one has given me any kind of solution on that or a proposal. It's like it's, it's not being addressed, and I'm very concerned about that. Uh, I don't I got 48 more minutes, or 47 seconds. Okay, so that part of Ponderosa Boulevard is bold because there's a natural drainage there. When all, when you get a lot of water, it comes straight down Ponderosa Boulevard into that bold area. If that drain is not on the street, is not clear, it goes under the fence, down my backyard, causes erosion until finally it gets to the French or the uh, culvert and where it starts going back underneath uh, the uh, uh, underneath the road down to the uh, 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 ravine. So I'm very concerned about that. That hasn't been addressed. Uh, and one other thing I would like to suggest is you should visit the spot. You should look at it. For, for whoever said they could have 47 homes there, if they didn't do the PUD, that's, I won't say the word, that's nonsense. You can park on Ponderosa Boulevard and just look over there and see that it is not suitable for what's being proposed. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Okay, next up and wishing to speak in opposition is Eric Klinkhammer on Bunting Lane. Hello. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Eric Klinkhammer. Uh, I'm also opposed to this development because it's an increase in density. Uh, I'm usually opposed to increases in density because they're not safe. I don't have a problem with real estate agents or developers. I'm, I'm sure they're all lovely people. I'm sure the city employees are great. Um, but density is unsafe. <coughs> um, sort of a sad fact of life. And in this case, it's not just traffic or crime. It seems that it's also fire potential flooding, steep hills, and I, there was mention of a geo survey that had to be done. And I noticed that we did not get comments for the appeal from most of the emergency services in response. I know in general, they don't usually respond to those requests, uh, but I think with this property, it would be sort of fitting if you can just get that from them to see if it is safe to build the, what they're proposing and to make sure all the surrounding properties can be safe. We heard from someone that there's concern with fire already. That seems like a problem to me. Um, in addition, just sort of that comment about 100-year storms. We seem like we're getting unseasonable weather all the time. I think we should take that concern seriously. And uh, finally, um, the fact that the PUD is non-conforming to the comprehensive plan. I, I have heard, I think, both Mr. Wolf and uh, Mayor Jacobson say that that plan is sort of binding. Uh, when we complain about density in other cases, it is sort of a comment is made that the plan says this, therefore your objections are sort of invalid. In this case, I, I don't see why the plan is being uh, overruled in favor of this PUD, especially given all of the other concerns. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, next, wishing to speak in opposition, Lori Allen on Timber.
tall timber loop. Just your name for the record. My name is Lori Allen. Okay, so I wrote some stuff down here so I would remember um, everything. Um, we actually live over off of, uh, on the other side of Greensbury. And the problem that I have mainly is our children because we have children that go to Ponderosa. And when they go to Ponderosa, uh, they sometimes ride their bikes. They like to go play at the school there's no other place for the kids to play. You can't send them over to Black Bay if you're in that area because there's a lot of people coming over from other places utilizing that park area. So I'm not gonna say, hey kids, run over and play at this park where you could get you know, whatever happened to you could, and maybe fall into the river, <laughs> there's no, equipment for the kids to play on, there's nothing there. They go across Greensbury. What you're proposing is adding so much traffic to that area. And not only that, it is um, a unique property like they said. It's just, uh, I don't know what you expect the kids to do. And then this is supposed to be a private place, not a place for the public to be. So, I would ask you to consider what you're doing in regards to the kids that go across that street that's already busy. Uh, we already have issues. The post office is there. The train tracks are there. You sit and you wait at Celtis right there when you're going to make a turn because of the train. Everything gets backed up on Celtis going both directions because of the train. And now you're adding more to that. And then also the kids walking or riding to school. I don't see how that makes any sense whatsoever. Um, what else do I have here? That's my main concern, is having my children run over. Um, we also become a thoroughfare, as it is right now. People trying to get from off of Greensbury down Plaza Drive and then heading up handy to Third Street, okay, to avoid Third Street for whatever reason. So you're adding to that as well. Um, the school is overcrowded, and they have a trailer there at the school already for some of that. That needs to be a consideration. That planning department doesn't deal with that. Um, the fire. I don't know why they signed off on it if they did, because that doesn't make any sense at all. And um, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. I have a question for you. Yep. Uh, do you belong to your HOA? Yes, we do. Uh -huh. And so is there not a park on Plaza Drive? The park on Plaza Drive is just uh, an open field. Uh -huh. There's no equipment for the kids to play. But There's you pay HOA there. fees to use that park and that riverfront? Um, there's only a 30 foot wide riverfront. I've been and there. The, oh good, then you know. And I've it been goes here down 65 like that. years. Okay, good. So there is a park there. Okay, you but pay you're not HOA listening to what I that. have to say because I'm not here for you to, to sit here and do I'm just things. asking you to be truthful on where the park Why is. Why don't you be truthful? There's no equipment there. There's nothing for the kids to do. They're just supposed to run around in a field and do nothing. I, I don't know what they're supposed to do. Okay, and then there's a 30 foot that the, that if you've been there for so long and you know the area so well, the place put a fence across it. There's a, there's a uh, judgment right now going on where no, we can't use that area. They put a fence there from the church. So we can't get down to the river. There's just a wide open place and usually people let their dogs roam. That's all it is. Thank you. Yeah. All right, welcome. next up is uh, David Allen wishing to speak in opposition.
Hi, my name is Dave Allen. We just moved down here about a year and a half ago from Bonners Ferry. Um, prior to that, I was a deputy sheriff, and I also worked in area areas where they had seen kind of unbridled growth. Okay, and that's what's happening here. Okay, from a law enforcement perspective, looking from the outside, this is kind of a crazy town now. Okay, with all the different apartments that have gone in, and all the infrastructure that I see going in is going up 41. Okay. All the road infrastructure isn't going down Greens Ferry. Road infrastructure isn't going up. It, yeah, I don't see any road improvements going up. Um, um, sorry, uh, Ponderosa. I just don't see it right now. My kids go to school. Those are my dogs in this fight. Okay, they go down there and play. And what my wife said is true. It's all blocked off. They put a fence across that the the church, and there's a big legal battle that's coming. There. Okay. So. Does our little um, area have enough money to put, put into that? No, right now, to get everything done for the kids to play. I can't afford to do that myself, okay? Now, my children go down to that school and play. They go with a lot of their friends. They ride their bikes, they walk, they do everything. You're talking about adding 450 cars a day, okay? That's 450 more chances a day that my kids could get hit. If one of them die, okay, as a result of this, and without you guys putting in the correct work and looking at what is going on here, the infrastructure is what I'm saying. That's on you guys, okay? I put that on you guys for that, okay? These are children we're talking about that go there. I talked to the principal today. I asked him if he had heard about this program going in there. He said, well, this is the first I've ever heard of it. Okay. Was he concerned? I don't know. I would guess he would probably want to hear about it. Maybe have the city come and talk to him about it. What he thinks about an extra 400, 450 cars going up and down the road. What about all those apartments? What is it, 900 apartments, one in one? How many cars go to each, each apartment, two? How many of those are having their kids go down there? What about the other apartment right down the street? President Wilhelm, can I ask a question? Are we getting off topic here? We're, where are we talking about 450 cars and a bunch of apartments? We're talking about 40. 450 cars that, are, that, that they are saying will be more cars going up and down the road for this development per day is what they are saying. Who's they? I haven't heard that. What was it through? Excuse me, sir. You're not up. You have to come up here to testify. So if you're, you testify later, you can come up to the mic. Okay. So I'm just trying to get some clarification on okay. a number that no one innocuous has presented. Number? Yes, some okay. innocuous. So, so that's that's what I was given, and that's why I'm here. I'm I'm a little bit scared about that. And like, like I said, my only two real dogs in this fight are my two kids. Okay, they mean everything in the world to me. And, and my kids go, going back and forth, they, they like to go up there and play. All their friends do. We're talking nine, ten kids go up there a day that I know of to go play. During the summer, during the winter, whenever. That's extra vehicles. I'm worried about my kids here, guys. I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up and wishing to speak in opposition, Barbara Nygaard. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Okay, and wishing to speak in opposition, Stephen Godfrey. Just your name for the record, sir. My name is Stephen Godfrey. I live on Forest Glen in the Ponderosa area. I've been taking some notes from uh, things that were being said this evening, and I wanted to touch. I had basically some questions, rhetorical questions for you. More so, I don't expect an answer from you. One of the things that the, your city planner or the person that was up here representing that 
said something about the fees that will be paid by the applicant for the impact on the community. Now, I've heard of a similar fee. Uh, I remember a smog fee in California uh, that if your car didn't meet smog, you paid a fee. Didn't get rid of the smog, didn't really do anything. So I'm not sure how appropriate a fee for the impact that it's gonna have on the community really does anything, okay? And then he mentioned something about the community will have its fair share of like the responsibility or the impact of this. I don't know if they mean the community inside that they're doing, because we seem to find a couple of variations of what community means, or the whole Ponderosa community, or just that gated community. I think is probably the better way you guys can decipher, since you are going to have a gated community there. A couple people that came up here for seem like they're people who are involved in the process. So it makes sense that they would be for it. And one of the things that kind of, I didn't quite understand what was, why it was being brought up is how the integrity of the people being involved are good. Let's hope so. I mean, because integrity is all you have in life. I mean, to be a good person, you gotta have integrity. So hopefully everybody involved, including everybody sitting on the seat, has their integrity intact. I know I spent 30 years in the United States Army, and so my integrity is intact, and that's why I'm here tonight, because there's too many issues that seem to be we're having with this planned community that's going down there, and the density. One of the things that I've noticed about Idaho, and the reason why we, re we retired here in Idaho, is because of the size of the lots. You have a standard in the military. I'm far too familiar with standards. And the standard is like right here. There's a minimum. That's actually what the standard is, is the minimum, okay? And in the military, if all you do is meet the standard, you'll get by. We all will. Nobody's gonna die necessarily if this is community is built, all right? If you put in 47 or 48, well, do me a favor, one less house. Okay, 47 houses on 11 acres, is that what it is? And it's not all habitable acres. So what is it actually, where is it, the, what is the actual footprint? So from what I understand this is supposed to be is your responsibility to decide whether this is good for the community in Ponderosa. Not sure how many of you live over there, all right? But those are the people who should be deciding on that. The biggest impact that we're, we're neglecting is infrastructure. I heard about the 450 cars too. I don't know about the facts on that. But there is going to be an increase. The infrastructure, they're not going to widen that road. They can't. They're not going to put a turn lane in for people who want to turn who are going to back up traffic. The infrastructure in Post Falls is neglected at best. And that's the city's responsibility. Safety first. That's what you, are, you guys are here for, is for the safety of the community and Post Falls. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, next wishing to speak in opposition is Howard Burns on Rocky Point Court. Uh, Howard Burns, I live on Ponderosa. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, the staff, whoever did it. The actual the posting sign is actually higher this time. You can read it from your car. I still think it should be two feet by four feet, but at least it's about four feet high, and the little yellow sign can be read if you want to stop your car and get, look at it and read it. Secondly, all the talk about the drainage and the culvert and this giant ravine that's on the property, which you folks haven't seen, it is clearly a 25 to 35 percent grade, is going to be uh, extremely exacerbated by the hearing that is out there on the 29th, which is going to try to add another giant apartment complex like the one that went in on Spencer, right up the drainage field that provides the water that comes down through the culvert and through this property. So you're talking about an entirely different drainage system if that R3 900 new units 
Plumber Properties gets approved. The zone change from industrial to R3. The comprehensive plan is that's all industrial. It should stay that way. Mr. Wolf, you had two questions uh, uh, that you asked when you asked about the open space. And I will tell you that a lot of the open space is 25 to 35 percent grade. The open space usable, yeah, once you get down there, once you've climbed down to get to it, and of course it's only for the community. In terms of the street pattern, does it meet code? If you went the same street pattern, you chain, got rid of the alleys, you made all the streets match, I did real estate for a living, you can get 33 to 35 homes on the property, leaving the ravine alone, because if you try to touch that ravine, you're going to be putting in a giant storm drain, and you still need retention basin somewhere. The lovely lot plan that came conceptually out of the blue here today with 48 lots has no storm drain shown no retention plans nothing it's a pipe dream it is as noted by mr. flowers designed to scare us into making the 47 home project seem acceptable secondly the streetscape that's enhanced quote unquote is all enhanced inside the project it's not enhanced for the people that live on Ponderosa we look at 10 garages garages only on Ponderosa, yeah, there's a little 10-foot buffer of plants and a fence, then an alley, and then 10 single garages, one for each of the townhomes, and they're just garages all fronting on Ponderosa. The houses and the beautiful streetscape you saw is all inside for the residents to enjoy, not those of us that live there today. The people on the west side, the people that own the property, they get the same thing. They get about 14 garages only on an alley and a five-foot landscape <coughs> buffer. At a minimum, if you insist on approving the project, at least insist that there be a dedication that the adjacent property owner can access that street, make it a full-size street, and get some use out of it so there's not two alleyways with garages. Um, the economics of that 48-lot pipe dream um, I say if they think they can do that and make it economically work, I'd rather have the 48 R1 lots than this. It's R1, keep it R1. On May 22nd, 2020, the staff gave a incomplete mail to Scott MacArthur. It's page 300 in your packet. On August 5th of 2020, the staff sent the applicant, Thomas Tedder, a letter, page 288 of your packet. And in it, he, they, they included the application with numerous items in red that needed to be addressed. Basically, the staff addressed all the items. All the applicant needed to do was change the font to black. At least that's the way I interpreted what was written, that all the red was from the staff. All they had to do was change the font to black and say, oh, our application's great now. All the questions have been answered. Well, staff did it. Who is the staff working for? The staff should be neutral. The staff should try to make everything as difficult as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Linda, could we maybe take a five-minute break again? Uh, Councillor Anthony needs a five-minute break, so we're going to take a five-minute break.
not back yet. <laughs> we can't start without Shannon. Oh. Or Warren. If we're here past nine, are you going for pizza? Um, <laughs> I have to be to work at six. Everyone keeps you guys happy. Oh, here we had a... Uh... Okay, we'll come back to order. Thank you. Your Next up, and wishing to speak in opposition, Sharon Pello on Ponderosa. Oh. Just Hi. your name for the record. Uh, Sharon Pello, 2966 East Ponderosa Boulevard. I've lived there since 1998. <coughs> I have no fancy titles to my name. I'm just a mom and a granny. And I didn't want to speak either, but I want you to hear my heart. And my biggest concern is for the little kids that go to that school. Every day they walk, they run, they ride their, their bikes, they ride their scooters, they push, they trip, they wobble. They're, some of them are only in first grade. And I don't think it makes any common sense at all to have all these little kids there and have so many more cars on the road. I mean, it's just... It, it will be on your hands, and I don't think it, it <laughs> it's already a busy street, and it's gotten busier and busier the longer I've lived there. And sometimes it takes a few minutes to even get out onto the street from my driveway. And I, I want to see a fabulous development in that land that's next to our, our, our development, but I want to see one that's less dense with less traffic. And that's what I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, wishing to speak in opposition, Zachary Pettibone. Just your name for the record. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Zachary Pettibone, and Council, thank you for giving me the time to speak. I live on, on Shore Pines. It goes right off of Ponderosa Boulevard. And I drive that road every morning when I go to work and when I come back. And I can tell you, you know, we're, I work full time at Ace Hardware. Um, I, in the past, I've, I've worked about, there about four years now. And I can tell you that the growth here in Post Fall and the amount of business that we've been doing, we supply hardware for fam families, um, homeowners, you know, when you have a problem with your shower your bathroom, what, whatever, bulbs, all these kinds of things. We have people that, um, you know, they need to service their houses. So I'm seeing the growth and how chaotic it's getting. And, you know, like I said, I drive that road every, every day. Um, I've seen, there's actually, um, there's some driveways, I think, that come out on Greens Ferry. I've seen people backing out onto Greens Ferry because they have a driveway that comes out. And the infrastructure just doesn't make any sense. If we're going to have 47 homes in there, you're talking about, you know, I, I grew up in a big family of, you know, eight. I'm one of eight siblings. And we all, you know, when you grow up, you have cars. And 
you know, mom has a car, dad has a car, your brother, your sister, you're going to be parking, and then you got what happens, you know, you know, you have to park on the street at sometimes, and you got to back out, and it's, it's annoying, you know, if you only have a small garage, and you got to move, and basically, if you're on the street, like, we, we move our cars for the snowplow when, when, it's, when we're expecting a storm. We don't leave them on the street, and our cul-de-sacs are full to the, you know, giant mountain of snow. They have to put the snow somewhere. And I'm just thinking, I mean, they could try melting it with flamethrowers or something. I don't know, but it's got to flow somewhere. We're lucky we haven't gotten a big snowstorm in the past, you know, I don't know, you know, since 2008, I guess. It was the last one where it was 20 feet. People didn't have power way off out, you know. But I just, um, you know, it. I think if the builders, if they really had a good intent with this, if they were, or not the builders, but the developers, I guess, um, it is a good opportunity. You know, we, I understand people need homes, they need to move in, and it's good for the city to have people, you know, more people in business and stuff. But there, there does, it, there is a, sit, a median or a happy medium where things make sense and I think the density of this proposal is pretty extreme. And it wouldn't be, you know, I mean, there's, if they could, if it was not 47, I mean, that, that's, that's uh, compared to every, every, all the other housing around, it just would stand out pretty, like a, like a pretty bad eyesore. But it, uh, I, think, uh, I think I'm done here. And thank, thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, Zachary. Okay, um, wishing to speak in opposition, I think it's Daryl Elo. Is that right? Daniel? Is it Daniel? Daryl? Sorry. <laughs> Just your name for the record, please. <clears throat> uh, my name's Dan Elo, and uh, a lot of the things that I wanted to say, I, I've lived on Ponderosa for 24 years, Ponderosa Boulevard. I think I could probably say I've probably lived in the in the first house that was built on Ponderosa. It was built in 69, so really, really old house there. But uh, seen it develop there uh, over the last 24 years. Um, and just some of the things that, you know, I can say that everybody's talked, so I'm probably going to hit just on a lot of the points that already have been, been covered. Uh, you know, the first thing is, is that the developers, I'm sure, you know, you guys are geniuses, you know, that the AutoCAD and say, hey, you know, how do, how do we develop this property the best we can? How do we take the landscape? How do we do it? Um, which makes sense why they want to be able to go ahead and change it to, you know, a PUD. Uh, right now, obviously, if it's zoned an R1, you know, that's been established by the city. Uh, you know, why do you zone the different zones the way that you zone them? You know, an R1, an R5, you know, all the different codes. I've, I've built here in Post Falls. I've, I've owned multiple properties. But, you know, there's a reason and a, and a rhyme and a reason why you guys put that zoning in place. So when you go in and apply and try to say you want to change that zoning from an R1 to something else, there's a reason behind that. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes what that reason is sometimes is actually math or economics or profitability. And that's the job that, that developers need to do. They say, how do, we, how do we maximize this property? And all due respect, that's what you want to do. But the fact being is, is that if you want to go ahead and leave that property as an R1, you can still maximize the property. You can still make it a, a great place to live. I think everybody has a right to d enhance their property. So I don't want to sound like I'm a proponent for it. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of commerce. I'm all in favor of you developing the property. It's your property. Develop the property. But I'm not in favor of, of changing the, the zoning. Leave it as an R1. Develop the property. Do what you can. Go ahead and make it the best you can. Make it to where, to where it's accommodating from that. Um, you know, why did you make it an R1 initially? Because it was a re residential. It was intended to be a residential, and that's what it's been for, for, for many years. Um, when you change that zoning and you change it to a, a different zone, go from an R1 to R5, and again, I apologize if I'm using the wrong, wrong terminology, but if you change that zoning, well, what you do then is you go ahead and then you put different types of homes in there, and going from a single-family home to a duplex to a quad to, to some of these different types of dwellings. You have zones for that. That's where the apartments were built. 
the, that's what's zoned for that. It accommodated that. It's going to accommodate that for actually for the fire departments, for the police departments, for response time, for accessibility. I'm sure that was all taken into place on Spencer when that apartment building was put in place. I'm sure there was a lot of work that went done into that. Um, I think the, the you know, just a couple other things that I wanted to point out. Mill River, if anybody's familiar with Celtis, if you go down Celtis on the way to Coeur d'Alene, there's Mill River, that whole development that went in back over there where U.S. Bank was. They, they planned that whole area in there. They put in that whole subdivision. They put in a lot of homes there. They also put in access to the river that was also for that development, but it was also community access as well, too. And I'm not saying the access that to the river has to be community access. You own that property, use the property. That's your property. Develop it for the members that are going to be there. That's not a problem. But I'm saying is, is the development that, that was put in there that was planned. It was planned for that access. Um, the, you know, some of the other information that's been presented as well, too. Uh, my mother-in-law moved up here five years ago. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Ms. Wilhelm, when you made the comment about that property and about the HOA laws, there was an HOA. But being the fact that that property wasn't theirs and there was a big lawsuit and they did put a fence up. And so that is factual. And so it's unfortunate that there seems some sort of disagreements that go on here during public comment. But I think that's also important to say is that the public comment that we're trying to make has to do with some of these things that are going on in our communities that we live in. And so that's important to understand that. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, well, I think it's wishing to speak in opposition. She didn't mark that, but Cindy Draper. I'm going to mark it for you, Cindy, OK? Um, I don't have a, a whole lot to say other than the fact that um, my name is Cindy Draper, and I live on Ponderosa Loop. Um, and I'm op opposed to this because one of the traffic and stuff. But one of the things that um, people keep saying is Ponderosa is, we're a community. You know, whether we're Ponderosa Loop or, you know, Ponderosa is, you know, we, we stretch for, to the other side of um, Ross Point, you know, and stuff. And this development, it feels like it's, it's, it's a community in itself, and it's not part of Ponderosa. And that's, I just, you know, I just wanted to express that the fact that I just feel that, you know, it's not a part of us. And, and I... And I enjoy our, our community. We're a lot of us are very tight, tight knit. And obviously, we've all come together, you know, here today, you know, because we enjoy what we have. We enjoy the peacefulness, the quietness, um, you know, and that's that's the way we want to keep it, and that's why we're here. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, wishing to speak in opposition, Tyler Bethke. Tyler, are you here? Left. Uh, in opposition and wishing to speak, Dora Heitman. Just your name for the record, please. Dora Heitman. And I'm sorry about my screamy kids earlier. <laughs> I like that on the record. <laughs> I didn't hear them. Oh, no. yeah. oh thank you goodness. Too. Okay. So um, I have a little boy, um, and he wants to walk to school. And so I want to keep him safe. And um, I think there was a, this fall we had a hard time with the levy. And so I'm also worried that the increase of children at, at the school, right, is not necessarily going to be covered by in time. So right now, there's like 26 kids in his class, and I'm, I'm fearful of the increase if it's not taken into consideration that it is going to, like, diminish his ability to learn and grow. And so that's, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> keeping it safe and he wants to walk to school and I want him to be able to walk to school but I also am nervous about traffic so that's all I got <laughs> thank you 
actually thank you all. Uh, okay, so that is everybody that is going to speak. And now we are going to have rebuttal from the applicant and you will have 15 minutes. Linda, it's eight. eight. What? It's eight. eight. Oh. I'd like 15, Sorry. but we were told eight, President <laughs> Wilhelm. Well, I don't know. The mayor gave me the list. <laughs> <laughs> he tricked you. <laughs> I know. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Council, thank you for the opportunity to rebut. You know, I'm reminded of, the fa of a project I did on Hayden Lake, which had similar topography. The only thing that was significantly different than what you face tonight is the Centennial Trail adjacent to the project. And I heard much of what I'm hearing tonight. Ironically, about three weeks ago, I was stopped by a gentleman in the grocery store who I didn't really remember or know. As you can see, you see a lot of faces in these, and I usually see the back of their head while they're speaking. And the gentleman said, I just wanted to let you know that you were right. The conditions of approval were what you said. They did what they said they would do, and it, the project turned out great, and we're happy with it now in the neighborhood. And I had to say to him, well, thanks for those kind comments, but I did nothing. It's the conditions set by the deciding body and the enforcement of those conditions done by the staff. If done properly, they alleviate the concerns that you're hearing tonight. So let's talk about those. First off, density. The 48 lots we presented to you is not a threat of this is what we're going to do if you don't approve it. It was done as a comparison because you're hearing, well, if we had a traditional layout, we would have fewer lots. Um, I do want to set the record clear that that was submitted with the August 23 letter that was submitted to the record. I don't know why it didn't make it to council's packet. I'm not sure that your attorney has yet discerned why it didn't make it to council's packet. But that's not a new piece of information. And it was just done so we could raise this issue to you tonight that um, we're not asking for that much more density. It, it's just how we're distributing our density compared to the open space we're trying to work in. And staff has told you under a PUD we could get up to 5.5. We're not asking for that. What we have is 4.7. We did meet with some of the neighbors based on that uh, meetings with some of the neighbors, we did reduce our density before finalizing the plan we presented to the city. Um, those meetings were in December of 2020. We finalized our, our application in January of 21. So we have tried to work with people, but sometimes it's difficult because, as you've heard some of these rumors tonight, 470 trips and we're building a huge apartment building, sometimes it's just difficult to try and knock back the rumors that get circulating. So on the density, we're not proposing a, a huge amount of density compared to a, tra a traditional layout. Let's discuss the hazardous conditions and the unique aspects of this site. There is a ravine right now that provides drainage. It's unfiltered drainage straight to the river. When the water gets high enough to go through the culvert, and our engineer will address the culvert, I'm sure Ms. O'Dowd misspoke. There is an engineer in the room tonight. I did bring one. Mr. MacArthur will speak to you as an engineer on that item. I think it's just her engineer was not in the room tonight. Um, uh, looking at what uh, her engineer, Mr. Coleman, has to say about the site, I just would point out Mr. Um, Wilson made the comment that our second geotech report, we've done two geotechs on this. One was in preparation of what the staff had asked us to do, and you have that one in your packet. The second one was done not for rebuttal. We didn't know Mr. Coleman was going to write the report he wrote. It was done because we were ordered to mediation, and we didn't want to come in here and discuss mediation. That wouldn't be appropriate. It was done to try and discuss a proposal that was on the table. But as we sit here today, our engineer will discuss with you the retaining wall can and is feasible. We didn't do a second geotech on that because we decided halfway through that it's not feasible. Usually when you have a condition of approval such as the wall has to meet your staff's um, review and you do have w very experienced professional staff, your engineers are not two years into the job. I well know that they're 30 plus years into the job. So you have very well-trained technical staff to look at these and evaluate it. 
you rely on staff, you don't rely on dueling engineers. It's not incumbent on the applicant to come in here and prove they can do what they say they can do. It's incumbent on you to set the condition and then staff has to prove to your technical, our development team has to prove to your technical staff and present to them plans that show they can meet the condition of approval. The way you control it is conditions of approval, not prove that you can build it and then we'll tell you that we'll give you an entitlement. It's if you're going to build it, you have to meet this condition. You have to design a wall that meets the criteria and P and Z gave some good guidance on what that would look like. But that's how you shape it. You don't shape it on um, requiring the applicant to completely design it. Look at the cost that would impose to give an entitlement to completely design it and then decide after having two engineers up here basically debating it for you, whether you believe their credibility without your staff ever even weighing in on it. It, it is done by condition approval and I would submit that's the proper way to do it. I would also note that Mr. Coleman's not a geotech and your staff did require a geotechnical engineer's report with the first application. So when we say that um, approval tonight is putting the cart before the horse, I would actually um, submit to you that requiring the applicant, any applicant, not just this applicant, any applicant to prove to you that every condition of approval that you set can be complied with before you've even set the condition of approval is an impossible standard. What the code envisions is that there will be performance standards and if you have concerns about those being met, you set conditions of approval on that. I want to talk for a moment about the reduced values. There's no evidence that the, this subdivision will reduce the values. On the traffic, 10 trips per home for 47 homes for 470 trips just isn't anything I've ever seen and I've read dozens of impact statements. Because we're running out of time, I am going to have Mr. MacArthur address the wall and the stormwater because I think that's something that's more important to you. Uh, <clears throat> again, Scott MacArthur, MacArthur Engineering. I just wanted to talk to you real quick. I guess the first thing would be the stormwater pipe that uh, traverses the uh, Ponderosa Boulevard. Uh, we do account for that. We've worked with staff on how we address that. We are diverting that pipe into our uh, large stormwater swale, so it is being accounted for on the property. Uh, that was originally submitted, discussed. It's in my narrative. Uh, and it was it was well discussed with city staff, and so there were no opposite, you know, no concerns whatsoever. Uh, maybe there was some misunderstanding on the plan uh, on the opposition's part. So, uh, again, the retaining wall, we did get the retaining wall design. Um, our legal counsel uh, is aware, but we we paid a geotech to go out and design this retaining wall. The modification that uh, Miss O'Dowd's referring to is we went from a rockery wall to a Verity block wall, and we were during this mediation process trying to work on how we can provide some buffers for the neighbors. Uh, it was just a, that's the modification that we brought forward and said that would be a better modification uh, rather than the rockery wall. And, um, but stormwater would be on the property. If we were to divert that road that they're talking about, taking it down in the middle of the ravine, that wouldn't make much sense. All the stormwater would funnel down the street section and into the river. So <coughs> right now all the street sections are draining uh, relatively uh, north as, as possible and we're retaining all the stormwater on our property, which is a requirement on, uh, the, the apartments that will drain into our development from who knows how far away, uh, that would be in violation of city code. Again, that resolution I discussed with you for stormwater requires that all developments treat their stormwater on their property. And uh, real fast, regarding the 48 lot layout, the 65 foot right of way, that is a 32 foot wide paved road with two sides, uh, parking on both sides of the street. Uh, so that is, that layout that we presented to you tonight isn't fictional, it was submitted, it was discussed. Uh, and we tried thank to actually you. bring it up later. Sorry, so thank but, you. yep, you got to stick with the time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. <clears throat> okay. So, um, does anybody have any questions of staff before, or can I, do I, should I close the public hearing? No, this would be appropriate time to ask questions okay. of staff. Okay, I have, I have a couple questions and then uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so I guess I wanna ask um, Bill, our city engineer, first of all, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very concerned about um, Mr. Carruthers' 
statement about the culvert on his property and that he has been there all those years and that that pipe is there and that it drains so much water and that he has come and no one has it, there there was no mention of that in all of these documents and it was the the dueling engineers here i mean uh, right. hundreds of if, pages of it if, no. if, if indeed there's a maintenance issue that needs to go on his site that is something that i'll relay to public works that's something i'm not dealing with but the culvert um that does cross ponderosa Bill, i hate to interrupt but could you step up to the microphone oh, i'm I can sorry really thank you, you. <laughs> yeah the, the culvert that does cross ponderosa is being intercepted by this development and routed directly to one of their swales that will have dry wells in it, and they're accounting for that drainage within, within the, uh, within their site. They're not just letting it free flow through their development and, and pretending like that culvert is not there. The the culvert is there. Any of the water that comes out of it will be routed directly to a swale that will have dry wells and and be sized appropriately for that. If there's a maintenance issue that needs to occur on the other side that I'm not engaged with. With, with public works, we'll address that with public works and ask them to go out and look at the maintenance issue on the north side of the roadway. But um, the rest of it is being intercepted and, and being addressed. Okay, and then secondly, um, uh, it has been stated that uh, this, that Coleman is not a geotech engineer. I mean, so we're getting, we have all of these um, engineer reports and um, the applicant, it looks like, has a geotech engineer, and then um, the homeowners have an engineer, but they're, it's not a geotech engineer. I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of confused about. So, so uh, civil engineers will specialize in, in certain areas. They might specialize in transportation. They might specialize in geotechnical engineering, which would be. Um, soils, foundations, um, drainage from a site, actually analyzing the soil properties and how they can be built on and mismanaged. They can go into structural engineering. Just because somebody's a civil engineer doesn't mean they have specialized in geotechnical engineering. I've worked with Mr. Coleman throughout the years. He probably has some knowledge of geotechnical engineering, but I wouldn't necessarily, my exposure to him is that he's probably not, that's not what he does day to day as a practice and a specialized and, and maybe gotten a master's degree in geotechnical engineering. They have had somebody who's gone out there, they've looked at the site, they've, they've addressed the soils from a drainage standpoint, the type of soils, how much drainage they can anticipate from the, from the drainage and how to build on the site and, and have submitted that um, for review, so. Okay, and then um, I guess, uh, well, I. I guess we'll just move on. I have several other questions, but I don't know if they're for you. So, um, Mr. Wolf. Great. Well, I think Bill answered quite a few of them. That's who I was going to ask the questions of, too. You've heard the and read the reports of the what we'll call the dueling engineers on this particular issue, but it's my understanding from what the uh, planning and zoning approved is that before any of this stuff is done, it's got to be approved by you. The, as, as with any um, PUD that would go through or the preliminary subdivisions, um, you know, until they, they would not proceed at all with construction drawings until we have actually approved those construction drawings and entered into a construction improvement agreement. Um, this site also requires um, a, a final stormwater prevention plan that is submitted along with the notice of intent to the EPA, they would not proceed to construction until those documents are also complete as well. So um, they have gone through, um, it's, a diff, it, it's not a flat site on the prairie, and I think everybody's acknowledged that. They've gone through and they've submitted a geotech, they've done a little bit more detail into how are we gonna retain um, retaining walls, how are we going to handle storm drainage and runoff and, and try to protect the river and everything else of this, more so than you might do on um, uh, a site out on the flat prairie. And, and so technically there's been a lot of information that they have provided above and beyond, but we typically do not see a final construction drawing 
until they've received subdivision approval and PUD approval. And at that point, we work with um, the technical folks on, on finalizing the construction documents. So, so you're right. So there, there's another step. They don't. They can't go to construction tomorrow after a hearing this evening. Right. So, I guess whenever I make a decision or vote on one of these things, I think about impact. How much impact is this going to have on the rest of the community and the people around it? And what I'm hearing from you and reading through here, and I apologize, you folks didn't get to read the 319 <laughs> pages that we got. But the impact from an engineering standpoint, stormwater, whatever the case might be, the retaining wall, the impact to anybody else within the city of Post Falls or the river is negligible. It will be because it'll be built to a standard that you will approve, correct? It, it'll be built to the city standards, yes. Okay, and you're the yes. city engineer and you're gonna and sign off on it. And I am the city engineer. I'm not saying there will not be an increase in traffic on Ponderosa Boulevard. No, I'm not but, asking but, you that. Well, but I'm, so there will be an increase, and, but um, it's, it's all um, accounted for within our transportation master plans. And, and how we have designed, you know, are looking at the future of our transportation network. We're, we're not going into this blindly. We continually look at those, look at the surrounding land uses and project the traffic along there. So um, there will be increase in traffic and it's something that you will have to continue to monitor and, and try to provide maybe safer crosswalks and look at those things as the years just continue by. It's just, it isn't a, an item that we would ignore completely. So. You jumped the gun on my next question. That was about the traffic. Okay. And I know Ponderosa is a wide road. And I know we have a transportation master plan in place. And in your expert opinion, is the increase to traffic on Ponderosa going to be significant to where we're going to have to make some major changes or just some Not, crosswalks or something like that? Yeah. No, I don't see it as significant you know, beyond what we have shown within our transportation master plan for 47 homes, it's going to continue to grow for a much greater impact. Just it, it will continue to grow um, just over the years, just as the community continues to grow. And okay. So the children in that particular area should be safe. And we'll continue to monitor that over time. Yes. Thank you. Um, Bill, I, I have a question along that line, too. If, um, uh, like um, Mr. and Mrs. Allen said, that uh, park over there on Plaza is closed or it, not accessible to those kids, that the, from Plaza going across um, Ross Point, or wh where are you going across right there to or to, yeah, Greens, Greens Ferry. Ferry to Ponderosa to get to the school. Um, if anything is built there, uh, can we, whether it is the PUD or it, whether it's 47 houses or whether it's 30 houses, if those kids are crossing that and using that as the park, I think that we should put a condition on any kind of building there with one of the flashing lights that we've been putting at the other danger zones. So, I mean, is that reasonable? We, we, could, we could look at that. That's not adjacent to this development. Um, whether it comes from, you know, a much larger pool, you know, I think it's reasonable to look at that and put something like that up there, particularly near the school zone. Right. Um, where whose responsibility that is, whether it comes from a larger collective of everybody that's using it versus, you know. Right, I, yeah, I. There's an issue. Yeah, okay. It's I, not I, like there's currently okay. an issue at that location. Yeah, okay, yeah. because I, just thinking about that, there is a lot of kids in, in that area, and if they're going that far to go to a park, because we've always talked about parks, and Mr. Wolf always brings this up, you know, <laughs> the circle about where the parks are on the map and if those kids are walking right. that far, there needs to be some protection from them. That's just kind of a side, right. side note. Right. Anyway, okay. Uh, to, I, I kind of wanted to back up a little bit to address Commissioner Wolf's question, you know, will the kids be safe? 
um, as with anything, they need to be able to conduct themselves in a safe manner as well. Sure. And, I get and that. th that's, that's I wasn't trying to put the, the burden of safety on you. I was just saying I, that. I just wanted your, to clarify, I can't guarantee it, yeah. but it, it needs to. Okay, thank you. Okay, Steve. Uh, just a couple of yes, questions. Steve. We heard quite a bit tonight about the concern of kids walking to school, like a safe walking route. How many of those homes, this would have sidewalks in front of it, this development? Do the sidewalks carry on down to Ponderosa from this development? Not, then? No, no not, not all along the way. The Centennial Trail does. The trail does, I know is there, but there's no sidewalks from there down? Not continuous. And then on yeah. the north side of the street, is that the same situation? You have some older neighborhoods and some newer neighborhoods yeah, that have, I would have side. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd have kind of spotty on the that, sidewalks? On that, yeah, so. Both ways. Yeah. So, th so that is something as well that we can look at over time and so maybe pursue some grants or, and try to come up with some funding to, to try make to that. Try to complete that safe sidewalk walks to, route. Safe walks to schools. Yeah. Safe, route, safe walking routes, because I know that is important. Yep. So. so we will take a look at that and see if there's some funding available and work with parks on doing that. And it, it probably could be some time before the Centennial Trail is rerouted back up towards Selty. So do you see this development having any adverse effect on the... Centennial Trail. Um, actually, I don't. I think having a one common access as opposed to multiple driveways where people are backing out. I think where folks, you have individuals that are pulling straight out. They can see what's, you know, you can see who's coming at you more than trying to back out onto a roadway and, and not being able to see somebody that's necessarily along the trail. So you're facing them more directly. Mm. That's okay. Lynn, anything for uh, the grades on the. Ravine Drive, have you looked at those grades on those two west and east Ravine Drive? Is that within our scope of? They, they allowing? will. I, I don't know what those specific grades of those roads are, but private roads still need to meet our, um, you know, city design standards. So, yeah. And, and both of those have <coughs> parking on both sides of the street, correct? On no, they're parking mm -hmm. on I believe one side, one side. of one street. side. Yes. Okay. Carrie, okay. you have anything for Bill? I don't know if it's for Bill. Okay. <laughs> do you have just, Do you have any questions for staff? Yeah. I I, I have a frustration for two hundred and some pages and two hundred and some hours. Um, or minutes in this meeting, it is so frustrating to see drawings as opposed to what everyone is describing and everyone in this room that has spoken has described a piece of property that I have never laid eyes on. And so that isn't a question, it's an observation of frustration. And Warren, to do on, it was mentioned earlier that we could do a site visit and not break our public hearing laws or so that is an option um, you can do a notice site visit you have to essentially publish notice tell people when you're going where you're going you have to make sure that you have a recorder so that everything that you say is recorded taken down so that we can create that verbatim transcribable record that state law requires that we generate but we can do it it's been done it can be done to do that we would have to continue this hearing schedule that notice it go do it reconvene to do consider uh, essentially do your weighing of the evidence at that point so we wouldn't have to go through public testimony again afterwards. no you could close the the hearing tonight and allow for a, a view of the site and then we would reconvene and you would then do your deliberations so on a site visit, would it be just the council members and staff, or would it be a representative from the applicant? It's a noticed public hearing. So, so anybody everybody and anybody who wanted to be there would be allowed to be there. Okay. okay. I would like that. Does everybody have that? You got, mm -hmm. you got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, because I, I have another question. I'm um, in going through the packet, and I don't know who can answer this, and it may be one or the other, um, the applicant or the appealant. Um, there was a, a lot of talk about the retaining wall and building it and needing an easement from the adjoining property owner, 
and from the sounds of things here it doesn't sound like any adjoining property owner is going to give an easement to anybody and so um in order to uh maintain a, a retaining wall that sounds like it's going to be a fairly large structure um has there been um ha has that been rectified so that it will be all on the applicant's property and can be maintained there on the applicant's property and if so could someone please stand up at the mic and say that mm -hmm. So while they're coming up, I can tell you we have no right to approve the developer building something on somebody just, else's I property. I just want to so know if that's been it's it, it's in the um, fair enough. Okay, just we can't authorize that, so it has to be built entirely on the applicant's property. No, no, no. Property. I know that's what I'm asking. I'm I'm asking are are they prepared to do that? Because in in the record, it it stated that something about an easement and all. All I'm saying is that it's obvious that whoever is the adjoining property owner to this doesn't sound like they're giving it an easement. And so does the applicant understand and agree that they're going to be able to maintain something that sounds like it's going to be um, uh, have to be moved all onto their property because it sounded like they thought it was going to go on the adjoining property or part of it. Yeah, and I can't speak to how, how they have designed it. That okay. I can't tell you, okay. but legally can, I can, can tell somebody, you it, it can has somebody to be all weigh on in? their property. Megan O'Dowd for the appellants again. Um, and, and I can't speak to how it's being designed either. I read the rebuttal documents and there was mention that there's adjustments plan to the retaining wall based on the concerns that Mr. Coleman raised in our last uh, appeal documents. Which is why, again, I, I recognize it is unusual for a council to require detailed construction plans. I think the reason that we're asking for that on the front end in this situation is because it is such a topographically difficult site to build on, and there is so much happening at the border of our property line. Our engineer would like the benefit. We haven't seen the um, adjusted uh, plans that the that the applicant is referring to, so we can't say whether or not the retaining wall has or hasn't been adjusted to stay off of the easement. Uh, that's that's why we're requ requesting these detailed construction plans. And if we don't do it at this stage, the the downside to to my folks, my clients in particular, is that there is no more public hearing. What what gets reviewed by the engineer then? How do my clients? continue to review President the Wilhelm, direct we're impact. getting well beyond the scope okay. of a bottle okay. here okay um, all right I think we in fairness need to allow the applicant to return and speak to okay Miss O'Dowd's comments yeah uh, Scott MacArthur MacArthur engineering so there there's no easement there's no request for an easement uh, we're required to construct well design submitted a design plan to the city showing that a retaining wall can be constructed the entire wall is not 10 feet tall there's a certain portion that is required to be 10 feet tall, but it goes from a zero reveal, meaning there's no wall, to a 10 foot tall wall, and then back down to a zero reveal. So there's a small portion, but there'll be no easement requirements. We have a geotechnical engineer versed in this uh, wall design. The modified wall was, again, something we discussed during mediation, uh, but it wasn't, uh, and we're willing to implement to implement a green space. We, we're trying to work with our neighbors, not trying to be uh, in opposition. So. Uh, the modification is simply a, just a, a minor shift, uh, improve aesthetics for both sides, just trying to help. Something they're not going to see other than the vegetation. And so uh, no easements required. There has never been an easement request. Uh, Mr. Coleman was simply in his report, in my opinion, uh, elaborating what he thought would be required, and it's not a requirement according to my geotech. So. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else have any questions? I'm going to close the public oh. hearing. Just one last one. And so this was at the planning commission meeting. They did set the, the 21 conditions from city staff. John, do we feel that the applicant has met those con conditions in reading through those? So those conditions appear to suffice and meet the review criteria that's set forth the PUD and the subdivision. 
that being said, though, we look to those conditions as part of the construction improvement agreement and future reviews that we go to those. Have they provided and met those conditions as required uh, per so, the review? So before they could go ahead and pull any permits, they'd have to meet these conditions on that then? Yeah, they'd have to, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. So if I might, President Wilhelm, council members, I wanted to provide a bit of context. We have a lot of folks here that have not been through a lot of hearings. And so I want to give them some context about how the council, or the planning commission and renders decisions and how this process looks like going forward from this point. Um, we heard one person question or a point to a statement saying that we have to give people a path to approval. Uh, that comes straight out of state law. State law requires that in a decision, we have to tell um, the reasons for the approval and denial. We also have to explain the actions, if any, that the applicant can take to obtain an approval. That's straight out of our state code. So that's the reason we, we pursue these things in the way that we do. Um, state law requires that we adopt a series of approval criteria, and those criteria are what guides our evaluation of any given hearing item. These are not really... Um, you're all aware of this because we do training on this, but these are not legislative matters. They're quasi-judicial matters, meaning that we act as a court. We only get to consider the evidence that's related to those approval criteria. So in this context, we have two approvals that are being sought tonight. First, a planned unit <coughs> development. Second, a subdivision. Um, you're looking at the record tonight trying to determine whether or not the applicant has shown that they can meet those approval criteria. And so your, your evaluation should be based solely on those, those criteria, not other things that you may have heard tonight. I did want to mention briefly, and I won't spend much time on this, we did hear a few people allude to concerns about crime and those types of things. Again, one of these things that you all know, it's not something that we can consider those start that starts to tiptoe up to the line of a Fair Housing Act violation. So to the extent those things are on your mind, those are the things that we need to put out of our mind. Focus in on the approval criteria, whether or not those criteria have been met, and whether or not a condition of approval is necessary to allow that, that criteria to be met. Your options for motions, um, we've talked about this a little bit. You can move to approve it. That's based on your analysis. You're explaining how the criteria is met can be an approval with conditions. Again, that same analysis, how it's met, in addition to the, how the conditions help those criteria be met. You can move to deny it, and in that instance, you're explaining how this application has fallen short. Um, we could continue the hearing tonight to allow for a site visit. If we did that, we would, we would continue it to a, a date in the future to allow us time to notice up a site visit and reconvene at that point in time and then come back and do deliberations. There's probably other permutations as well. Those are the main ones you've got before you tonight, but happy to answer any questions about any of that. I'm good. I'm gonna close the public hearing. Cool. Well, wait a minute, Warren, if I close the public hearing, then we can still vote to do the site visit. Yes, yes you could do thank that. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Okay, Councilor Wolf. You want me to start? Sure. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I love the, the feedback. Whether I agree with you or not, it's a material, I'm glad that you're here. A couple things that I wanna start off with. We got off track on this whole thing because there was so much discussion about density and I asked the question and the gentleman presented this I don't they're not going to build that but the reality is is in the city of Post Falls somebody's got owns 10 acres of land whether you own it you own it you own it you own it anybody that owns 10 acres of land that's annexed into the city of Post Falls can put 48 houses on that land. Let's forget about the topography of this particular land. That's just a reality. That's already baked into the laws and the ordinances 
that we as a citizens, citizenry have accepted, okay? So where the issue comes in is the fact that this is not a typical 10-acre parcel. So the density is out the door. It doesn't matter. If you own 10 acres in Post Falls, you can put 48 houses on it. So the density of this is not the issue. The only issue that comes up is that the applicant, the person that owns this property, just like I own property and many of you own property, has come to the city and said, because of the topography, I'd like to lay it out differently than this. So the d density question, I'm sorry, is off the track as far as I'm concerned. Because anybody can put 48 houses on 10 acres. We rely on experts. That's why I grilled Mr. Melvin as hard as I did, is because he's our expert. And he's the guy that's going to say how this is going to get done from an engineering drainage standpoint. So the, all those questions kind of go away. They go away out here because I'm relying entirely on Bill's expertise having served the city of Post Falls for all these years, that he will either make the decision or he'll find the experts to help him make the decision that this is going to fit and it's going to work and it's not going to impact any of the neighbors in terms of the drainage or the retaining wall or any of that stuff. He's also our expert when it comes to traffic. Can Ponderosa Boulevard Avenue handle the traffic that will be created by this decision. He's our expert. Everybody else out there is an expert of some sort, but he's our expert when it comes to traffic. He says, yes. Now, I can't guarantee that the safety of every child out there is uh, not going to be impacted. I have five children of my own. I have six grandkids damn right I I care about that too but when my expert says it's something that I can sleep tonight on I'm good with that there's a lot of questions about growth growth is a huge issue in Post Falls right now it's much bigger than the issue that we have before us tonight the only issue we have before us tonight is whether or not to grant the request of the proponent or in essence, reverse the appeal, and it all makes sense. It's 10 acres. It's going to have 47 houses on it. I don't know if I want to live there. The houses are going to be small. They're going to be on, but it's inside that 10 acres. It's not really going to impact anyone outside of that because... I'll have this discussion with anybody after the meeting, but right now I'm speaking, okay? Folks, let me, let me interject for a second. We have reasons for our hearing procedures, and part of those procedures is we treat everybody with respect. Um, please give everyone the appreciation and the, and the chance to speak without interrupting and speaking from the audience. Those are... This is an important meeting, obviously, and passions run high, but respect everybody's opinions, please. Thank you, Warren. That's all I got. But again, I'll be happy to be right out there in that forum and talk to anybody that wants to speak to me later. Carrie? No. I'll, I'll talk to anybody, too, <laughs> at any time. Uh, one of the things that... I'm going to just go just a wee bit over Warren over here. When people talk about, uh, you know, Post Falls has lost its small town feeling and, you know, it just doesn't seem like the same community. One of the challenges for something like this and, and how I can say that I know that really not to be true is that I can sit in a public hearing with so many people that I am acquainted with in various walks of life. Um, Mr. Elder, I'm going to pick on you. 
Rob Elder was friends with my little brother. I've known mm -hmm. Rob Elder since he was in elementary school. That has no bearing whatsoever on decisions that I am tasked with making according to the law. Um, so a lot of times things that I want to do would be inclined to do, you're not able to do because when it comes right down to it, and I, I'm thinking about the site visit, and I take that back, unless, you, unless everybody else wants to do a site visit. Um, I don't need to, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> geotechnical or otherwise. I guess I don't need to see the topio topography of this property. Um, at the end of the day, I just need to know that the criteria was met. And it's, that, too, is a frustration. So that's all I got. Steve? Well, when I look at this, this is uh, probably the most unique public hearing I've ever been in, I think, because of the, the property and the topography. And I, I'm more of a visual person. Yeah. It, it's, I, I don't, I can look at the drawings, but I really can't envision the property and how it would look. And if we don't do a site visit, I'm looking at some of the criteria that was set by the Planning Commission and in talking to our city engineer that they've guaranteed us those would be met and that the Planning Commission did put in some of those for the protection of the neighborhood. We did have a, a comment uh, from a fireman, and I respect him a lot, but we rely, when we submit our plans, to the other agencies, we rely on that fire department, the county fire department, to give us back feedback. If they have a concern, we need to know that. And if they're not giving us the feedback in writing, if they write off on it, they have no concerns, we have to go by our professional fire department. Um, when I look at this, I, I see that they've met by the letter of the law in our code what we have set up for a PUD that uh, they've met the requirements that we have set for that. So, where am I at? Lynn? Well, I have concern uh, as I look at this from the public safety standpoint, looks like the perfect trap to me. Um, one way in, one way out, basically, you've got an access road that the fire department signed off on. Uh, question would be to the homeowners who who would have access to that to be able to get that open and closed if you did have such a an emergency occur in there um, have concerns about the, the streets as far as the layout goes and being able to get fire trucks to be able to turn around in there and a, in a with parking on both one side or both sides of the street um, so parking is a big concern for me, and especially when it comes to SUVs, uh, RVs, those kinds of things. Um, we're seeing it in a lot of the other subdivisions where it's choking the streets down where you can hardly get through them. And uh, so parking there is a huge concern for me, especially when you're talking about having to run trucks or ambulances or those kinds of things through there. Um, as far as the the fire department did sign off on it, I'm kind of surprised at that. Um, but I think they've worked with the city and, and probably uh, been down a lot of these questions over and over again before they did their uh, due diligence. As far as the uh, subdivision goes and as far as the PUD goes, I think they have met all the requirements. Uh, I did ask a question on the slope of the roads because I was a little concerned about the grade, uh, especially wintertime, uh, pushing it down there into those cul-de-sacs and then you take away that turning radius by filling those cul-de-sacs up with snow. Um, they have met the requirements, so I guess That's all I can say. Okay.
okay? How about you? Well, um, I might I might have a little bit of a different opinion. Uh, I. I am not, um, I'm not totally sold on the townhomes along Ponderosa Boulevard and the, um, and the, again, like Lynn says, the, the safety of the roads. However, the fire department did sign off and didn't have a comment. And I'm um, concerned about the, um, I guess it's gonna be the east side, uh, where the water runoff is coming there i i'm i'm very concerned about it but like mr wolf says we have a city engineer with been with the city for more than 30 years and he's the expert and we are not engineers um i i don't think it really matters how i vote because i can hear the consensus of the rest of the council. So um, I'd entertain a motion. I'd move to approve the North Shore District PUD 0001-2021. Second. Okay, Shannon, will you take the roll? Wolf? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Orders? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Okay, that motion passes and move on to the subdivision. I move to approve the North Shore District subdivision item SUBD 0001 2021. Second. Shannon, will you take the roll? Wilhelm? Aye. Orders? Aye. Anthony? Aye. Orson? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Okay, that motion passes as well. And? Move to adjourn. Quickly before we adjourn for everyone's understanding from here, we will take your motion and flesh that out in a, a written reason decision. We'll bring that back to you at a future meeting for your review and evaluation. If it adequately captures your, your sentiment, then you would approve that and that would become then the final written decision of the city. Okay. Thanks, Warren. Carrie, before you uh -huh. do that, I just want to verify, and I think that Bill Melvin said this, um, that uh, Josh Carruthers, that issue of having somebody from the city go and look at his drain. I'm, I'm going to send another plug report, so I'm not charged. Perfect. Those, okay. Uh, just want to make sure that I had heard that correctly. Thank you, Thank you Josh. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Move to adjourn. Uh -huh. We're adjourned. I take notes.